Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. I, 34 female, was hanging out downstairs while my child, 5 male years, not months, slept upstairs in bed just like every night. I have a camera baby monitor that is close circuit, does not even connect to the internet. Basically only a camera and a handheld screen, doesn't hook up to a cell or anything. Anyway, last night I was sitting on the couch watching TV when I noticed my kiddo moving around. So I started watching the monitor to see if I needed to run up and lay with him before he fully awoke. Then it looked as if he was lifted an inch or so and tossed. So then I really watched the monitor thinking I didn't see what I thought I saw. Then it was like he got scooted up. Then it was like something had him by his upper arms and pulling him up into a sitting position with his head back like when you are trying to move someone that's sleeping and they are limp. I immediately ran upstairs and flipped the light on to find him sound asleep between the pillows covered in sweat. I called my husband in a panic because I was very freaked out and he told me that I probably didn't see it right or was imagining things and to not let it bother me. I could not get my heart rate and breathing to calm after about 10 minutes of sitting in the bed next to my sleeping kid. So I ended up scooping him up and brining him downstairs to sleep on the couch because I sure as hell wasn't going to sleep up there and neither was he. My husband said it was stupid for me to do that, but I was very uncomfortable being upstairs. My son slept through everything from being scooped up, carried downstairs and being placed on the bed, as well as me staying up for several more hours watching TV, not being able to sleep and woke up when I got up for work this morning at 5 a.m. I don't even know what answers I am looking for. I'm freaked out and terrified of what I saw. Today I had another scary experience. It was around 4.23 am. I woke up from my sleep and felt thirsty so I drank some orange juice next to me and planned to go back to sleep. After a couple minutes of quietness I felt sleepy and closed my eyes until I heard knocking on my window. Which scared me. I felt fear when I heard it because my window is next to me. It's above me by 7 inches. This was the second time I heard it since a month or two ago. I remember it so well because I was up watching some cartoons around 2 am when I heard knocking coming my window. And I didn't bother looking outside since there is some curtains blocking the view. I told a friend about this today and they said it was probably some branches or an animal. But I told them I sleep in the second floor of the house, and there is a screen window frame outside the window. Which is impossible for something to knock from the outside without removing the window screen. Does anyone have any experience with something or have any ideas on what it could be? A year ago, the crone-like spirit of an old woman haunted me. A medium explained that this spirit was my teacher in a past life, and that she'd return to guide me in divination and intuition. My attempts to establish a safe relationship with this spirit were not respected, so I asked a shaman friend for help in clearing this entity from my house. The night before my friend came over, I was so nauseous I could barely sleep. That entire day, I collected things for the ritual. I had 13 red and 13 white carnations, Florida water, the bell and candles from my own altar and sage. I felt prepared if uncertain. When I did sleep that night, my dreams were dark and disturbing. My husband, the cat and the dog all seemed on edge. That morning, my friend arrived shortly after my husband left for work. Opening all the window and the doors, we began setting up the space by lighting candles and smudging every corner of the apartment. The sage burst and crackled, shedding sparks among thick, fragrant smoke. I lost two good duvet covers that day. Both pets retreated immediately beneath their respective beds and stayed hidden for the duration. Preparing to call the cardinal corners, my friend used his phone's compass to confirm the directions. It was way off. I know my house and my corners and so oriented us correctly. But I felt suspicious, like maybe the entity herself was sabotaging our efforts to remove her. Finally, we began. 
My friend, beating a low, steady rhythm on his animal skin drum, invoked the guidance and protection of the spirit animals of the earth and the sky. I followed behind him, ringing the altar bell as he spit sprayed mouthfuls of spirit water throughout the apartment. Throughout this, two things rolled around in the back of my mind. The first, what will the neighbors think? The second was that I might vomit. The nausea I'd felt since the night before had increased past the point of simple discomfort. Next, my friend took the red carnations in batches, dipping them into a bowl of spirit water, then circling them in mid-air, just like we'd done while smudging. He went room by room, discarding the used flowers onto the newsprint we'd placed on the coffee table at the center of the apartment. Halfway through his work, he paused and suddenly rushed into the bathroom, becoming violently ill. In that exact moment, I lost the battle with my own nausea. Thank goodness for close friends and multiple bathrooms. Eventually, he'd used all of the carnations throughout the entire space. Perched on our couch, he ended the ceremony with frantic drumming and full voice singing. I could physically feel the energies in my home shifting around us. I gave one last thought to our neighbors and then joined him. My throat raw from the smoke and being sick. I sang out in my loudest voice to move the energies swirling throughout my home. Finally, the ritual was over. We placed the white carnations in a vase on the coffee table. If the ritual had truly exercised the spirits, he said, the carnations would still be white tomorrow when we woke. I thanked my friend, and he left. At his instruction, I then bundled the red carnations in the newsprint and carried them to the seaside, burying them in the sandy soil near a banyan tree. I was too tired when I got home to notice if anything felt different. I simply stumbled inside and fell straight into bed, briefly mourning the burn holes in my duvet. I slept most of the afternoon and all through the night. The following day, the white carnations were still white. I also wrapped these flowers in newspaper, burying them beneath a different tree in the park. As I covered my parcel with the last handfuls of soil, the nausea I'd felt for days cleared instantly, like gray clouds clearing to reveal blue sky. I suddenly felt, fine, also very hungry. I returned to a house that felt peaceful and ordered. I paid careful attention over the next several days, trying to suss out whether our banishment had succeeded. The crone was, and nearly a year later still is gone. Phew. I know that was a lot. I've had many strange and spooky experiences throughout my life. Holler if you'd like to hear more. Thanks for reading, folks. This happened to me and my then roommate a few years ago. We were just chilling on the couch and listening to the rain outside when at one point we started talking about how the rain sounded like the sea and how we pictured a lighthouse on a windy shore. I know this sounds crazy and maybe like we were on drugs, but we were not. We were completely sober. Slowly but surely the conversation between my friend and I started to shift to a visualization, or perhaps a hypnosis. It's unclear to me how this normal conversation about a lighthouse turned into the shared vision or dream it did, but at one point we were both there in the lighthouse. We both saw a man there, dressed in a yellow raincoat. He had a weathered face and a gray beard, but most remarkably in the place where his eyes were supposed to be there were two black holes, as if they had been gauged out and only some rotting black skin remained. We both felt this intense urge to get out, so we ran away from the lighthouse to the woods as he followed us. I'm not sure about how we woke up from this hypnosis, dream, vision, or whatever it was, but I remember realizing this was bad and we needed to wake up, so I urged my roommate to do so. After I returned to my body, I gently woke them up and we discussed what happened. When we had entered this state, it was around 12 midnight, but when we woke up it was about 3 a.m., yet it felt like we had only been doing this for 15 minutes. The next day we both separately drew the man we saw we were both illustration students without having discussed what he looked like. We drew the exact same man and had given him the exact same name, the Weirman. My question is, what was this? A state of hypnosis we entered through the rain, fully adieu, or something supernatural. 
If so, does anyone recognize a figure of a lighthouse keeper in a yellow raincoat with no eyes? Yes, this is real, and it happened this morning. I woke up feeling like any other ordinary day. The sun was slowly peeking through the curtains, casting a warm glow in the room. I needed to charge my phone, so I went to unplug my roommate's phone to plug mine in. That's when I saw it a missed call notification on her phone. Curiosity got the better of me, and I glanced at the caller ID below the phone number. Without thinking, I blurted out the name of the caller to my roommate. She chuckled, assuming I was playing a prank, until I handed her the phone. I could see her face change in an instant, her expression filled with disbelief and fear. She stammered, telling me it was her mom who was calling. Her mom, who had tragically passed away in 2006. The phone call had ended a second after she realized who it was. As she tried to gather her thoughts, she decided to call the number back. To our astonishment, an automated voice answered saying, press one for yes and two for no. We were both perplexed and terrified. How was it possible that her deceased mother's phone number was calling her? Her mom's number had never been stored in her contacts. It couldn't be a simple glitch. This was far too eerie and unsettling for that. A million questions raced through our minds. Was someone playing a sick joke, or was this something much more sinister? Could someone be stalking her, using her deceased mother's number to torment her? Or was it some inexplicable paranormal occurrence? We sat there, hearts pounding, minds racing. The room seemed to grow colder as we contemplated the inexplicable event. Our thoughts were consumed by the possibilities of what this could mean. Were we in danger? Was her mother trying to send a message from beyond the grave? Neither of us knew what to do next. Fear and confusion engulfed us. We decided to reach out to friends and family to see if they had experienced anything similar or had any insights into this strange phenomenon. No one had answers and each call only added to the sense of unease. Hours passed and we were still no closer to understanding what had happened. It felt like we were caught in a surreal nightmare unable to wake up. As the day wore on, we tried to distract ourselves, but the bizarre event lingered in the back of our minds, haunting us. Finally, as the evening set in, we found some solace in each other's company. Together, we held on to the hope that maybe it was just an inexplicable glitch or a cruel prank. We agreed to keep a close eye on her phone and seek help if anything like this ever happened again. As the night crept in, we sought refuge in the presence of friends and tried to find comfort in the mundane routines of everyday life. Yet deep down, we knew that this strange and unsettling event had forever changed our perception of reality. To this day, we remain haunted by that inexplicable phone call. We may never know the truth behind what happened that morning, but one thing is certain it left an indelible mark on our lives a chilling reminder that sometimes the boundaries between the living and the beyond are not as clear as we'd like to believe. So someone was following me home yesterday, and now I don't want to leave the house. I 15F was walking home from the store yesterday, and I saw a black box car drive past me extremely slow, and the man in the car clearly watching me. And when he fully passed me, I saw him watching me in his rear view mirror. I thought it was weird and slowed down my pace so that I could tell if he was waiting for me or just a slow driver. He was still driving extremely slow, but moved a little when he saw two guys riding past on bikes. He then moved to the edge of the short street we were on and waited there. I was still towards the beginning of the street, so I acted like I forgot something and turned around to get out of his sight. I waited and kind of peeked out to see if he had left, and when I saw he was gone I continued walking. I didn't think it would happen, but I made a mental note that if I saw the car behind me, it meant he circled back around. After I continued walking I made three turns and was three turns away from my house. When I was walking up a little hill and almost at the four turn, I looked back and saw the man at the corner I had just turned from, letting me know he circled back around to find me. 
He sat there watching me continue walking until I got up the little hill and turned the corner. Then as I had just barely made the last turn and was close to my house, I saw the man's car just turn the corner up the street, straight across from the way I was walking, waiting there. I pulled out my phone to call my mom and walk the other way, and he left soon after I pulled out my phone. My mom came out and walked with me back to the house, and I didn't see the car for the rest of the day. But I keep thinking, he knows what neighborhood I stay in. What if he comes back? What if the next time he comes back I'm out by myself again? What if no one's home to call? What if he sees me leaving and comes back when I'm the only one home? I'm so scared he's going to come back I don't want to go outside. I don't want to show him where I live especially because I'm home alone very often. I have summer school and I have to go. But I don't want to leave the house in fear he might be waiting for me. And I'm constantly looking out the windows to see if I can spot him. Especially since if he was at the store I was at, he definitely stays somewhere near the neighborhood. Okay, so ever since I was five I have been sensitive to energies. I see ghosts and speak to dead people and such. But this is crazy because it has happened not one, not two, but three times. The first time it happened I was five. I remember I had just gotten home from kindergarten and I went to take a nap. During the nap I remember sitting at a table with my papa by this time in his life. He already had bad heart failure and kidney failure, so he was on dialysis. He told me, don't worry about anything, you will be okay at this time I was newly diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and that would to me later having open heart at 10, and now at 16 I'm in heart failure and stage 3 kidney disease. He also told me that he loves me, and that he would watch me forever. I woke up and my mom was crying I found out that my papa's heart had stopped. The next time this happens I'm around 10 years old, I was at my dad's house and I was going to bed. My dream sequence started with me seeing my aunt on a beautiful homestead or ranch. She was dressed in a flowing white dress and she just looked so at peace. Then I see this dark figure come and it takes her away. While she's screaming and getting taken she looks at me and says, I'm gone now, I woke up and I found out she overdosed. The last time this happened was probably four years ago, maybe even earlier. I was sleeping at my grandma's house and I have a dream about her sister, my great aunt. My great aunt had bad dementia, I see her but younger and literally all she said was, I remember everything again, and I kid you not the next morning I find out she passed. In my family, a lot of people are Catholic, but a lot of people are also psychic and or mediums. I think I'm an empath because of my sensitivities and a lot more experiences I've had, but I don't know, this is kind of freaky. So to sum it up, I agreed to taking care of this family's dogs for five days, and the dogs have been great. Happy, healthy, normal pups in a somewhat seemingly normal house. I met the lady prior to coming and even came in the house and things seemed normal. First night I got here was fine until about the second day when all of a sudden the AC stopped working. It reached all the way up to 83 degrees where I was staying upstairs, so I had to move down to the basement, including the animals. Third night, we are downstairs in the basement. Prior to going to sleep, I left my phone plugged in vertically on the nightstand next to me and had all the dogs in their spots for the evening. I wake up at 4.30 a.m. I can tell by my watch to my phone being unplugged from the wall and phone completely dead. I then think that's strange because Ernst is no way I could do that in my sleep, but whatever. I get up to go use the restroom and I hear something in the bathroom. The shower was turned on and running water was going straight into the drain. With that being said, there was water soaked all over the ground. I had to use six towels to clean it up. Then the next day rolls around and I decided to give one of the dogs a bath in the upstairs shower at this point. The AC guy came out to fix it and said there was nothing he could do until he was able to check the pressure within a few hours he would come back. He never came back and the AC went back to normal when all of a sudden the whole shower rack falls on my head and almost hit the dog. Anyways, as the night unfolds, I slept fine. 
But I woke up at 7.30 a.m. to let the dogs out and I go to look at my phone and the charger is bent and stuck inside my charging port. Now I have to use a different one. It's my last night here and I don't really know what to expect now. Maybe I'm just overreacting, but something just doesn't feel right. Is this maybe something paranormal or just paranoia lol? Okay, so I've never posted like this before, so forgive me for any mistakes. But about an hour ago, I headed to a nearby lake, a place I usually go for my therapy sessions because it's usually pretty serene and peaceful. About 90% of the area can be seen from the busy road. However, there are a few blind spots. So I pulled into my usual parking area and immediately got a weird feeling when I saw another car parked kind of hidden under a tree close by. I'm a female in my 20s, so I'm always on high alert. I made sure to keep my eye on the car when getting my stuff together in my car. One second I look up and no one is in the car, and then a couple seconds later I look again, and a man is suddenly sitting in the driver's seat staring at me. It was like he came out of nowhere. At this point I'm pretty wary about going out into the grass by the lake, but I continue to slowly pack up my stuff while continuing to keep an eye on the man in the car. I open my door and the man immediately gets out of his car and stands in front of it, doing a weird stretch and still staring at me. This lake is very close to a very popular amusement park, so it's not uncommon for travelers to stop at the lake to rest. So I try to reason in my mind and decide I'll just sit in the car for my therapy appointment. I still had about 15 minutes before it started to get settled. So I get into my back seat and close and lock the doors, but rolled one window down because it was hot in the car. I open up my laptop and I look over at the man again, and now he's opening up an almost empty bottle of windshield wiper fluid and starts to pour it into his car as he looks up at me. His whole vibe was sketchy and creepy and I was debating on leaving. The man then pulls out his phone, does something on it, then continues to fill his washer fluid. All of a sudden, a white van with no windows rolls up and parks right behind me. No one gets out. I immediately climb over the console into the driver's seat and started to pull away. The van was close to my car, but there was enough room for me to back up and pull out of there. A couple seconds after I pull away, the van follows, and the man gets back in his car. I panicked, but was able to pull out onto the road in between two cars, so the van wasn't able to catch up with me. I made sure no one was following me as I drove home. It might have all been a coincidence, but better safe than sorry. I also called the non-emergency line just in case, and they said they would send an officer out there to patrol the area for a bit. Thanks for reading if you did. It was a scary experience, especially as someone who's been essayed. I'd like to hear any feedback or similar stories if anyone has any. so our boy's ages are three and two. A few days ago, about 30 minutes after we had put the boys to bed, I was in our front living room when all of the sudden I heard our oldest son crying out for me. I peeked my head out into the hallway and looked into our other living room real quick to see if my husband was already on it. He wasn't, so I walked down the hallway and went into the boy's bedroom and both of the boys were sound asleep. Weird. I shut the door and walked into the main living room where my husband was and told him what just happened. He just shrugged his shoulders and said he didn't hear anything. The room I was in is closer to their bedroom so I could see how he didn't hear him. Then last night just after midnight I laid down to go to bed. I was almost asleep until I heard my youngest son start to cry over the monitor. I waited a few seconds to see if he was just moving around and would fall back asleep or if it was the real deal. He starts hysterically crying, so I jump up and run down the hallway to their bedroom. The boys are sound asleep. I'm very confused. I go back to bed and fall asleep. Now a little backstory, I am a very heavy sleeper. My husband always had to wake me up when the boys were babies when they would wake up in the middle of the night because I didn't hear them. He always says I could sleep through the world ending and I would never know. So after I fell back asleep, I get woken up at 5am to my youngest son, 
hysterically crying again over the monitor. A little side note, both times I look at the monitor, I don't see either of the boys moving. I see them peacefully sleeping, but I hear the saying. I get my sleepy self up, look over at my sleeping husband, thought it strange that he was asleep and didn't wake me up, and sleeplessly walked down to the boys' bedroom. They are both sound asleep, now I feel like I'm losing it. I know what I heard. No TBS were on when any of these occurrences happened. We don't own a radio, and our monitor is one of those dinosaur ones so it doesn't hook up to Wi-Fi or anything. And the first occurrence with my oldest son, I heard with my own ears when my son was crying mommy. I didn't even have the monitor on. I feel like I'm going crazy. Nothing like this has ever happened before. One time I got woken up to something whistling outside our bedroom windows at 3 a.m. a few months ago. It kept moving from one window to the other in a matter of seconds. Very eerie whistling. We have a fenced-in backyard and the one window is in the fenced-in area. Our fence is six feet high, so that scared me even more thinking something was on our roof. I was absolutely terrified and frozen in bed. It finally stopped and I went back to bed. I talked to our next door neighbor about it that's lived out here his whole life, and he said he's seen and heard things out here that people would think he's insane. We live on a quiet dead end road with a swamp or heavy woods in our backyard. In 2009, I attended college at the University of Maryland or Eastern Shore. I always felt overwhelmed with studying and assignments and spent most of my time inside. My roommate and I decided to abandon our schoolwork one weekend and have an adventure. We agreed to go to a Sedeg Island. It's a barrier island and a refuge for wildlife. I was most excited to check out the feral ponies I had heard about. There do not seem to be many places where you can see wild horses anymore. So we decided to camp even though it was the off season and chilly. At least there were no crowds. We borrowed a bunch of gear from our hardcore camping friend and headed out. We stopped at the visitor center and the rangers told us where we would be likely to see the horses. They told us to make sure we put away all of our food items whenever we were away from the campsite. We showed them the bear-proof cooler we had borrowed, and they said that was fine. We set up our camping spot and went to the recommended trail, and when we were out there we caught sight of horses off in the distance. They told us to stay at least 40 feet away. We were happy to get a distant view of horses across an inlet. However, we were really excited when the herd stormed through the water and toured the area where we were standing. There must have been three different herds while we hiked that morning. We had binoculars to spot them in the distance and were satisfied with our sightings by noon. We had a cookout and relaxed on the beach. I was ready for bed early and got into my sleeping bag after sunset with my book. I must have fallen asleep immediately. The next thing I knew I was woken up by something howling. Now I'm familiar with coyotes and wolves, but this did not sound like that. It was higher and more shrill. It gave me goosebumps all over and I could feel it getting closer. I convinced myself it must be one of the island foxes, so I just fell asleep again. But then this horrible growl woke me up again. It was a low growl, guttural and rumbling. I could hear something rustling outside the tent. It was probably half an hour before the noises stopped and I could sleep again. The next day we decided to take the wildlife loop trail. It was maybe three miles long and gave good views of marsh and forest. We spent a long time exploring. By the time we decided to head back to camp, we were both pretty tired, and it was almost sunset. We came over the crest of a dunes and could see our tent a ways away. It looked like it was fluttering in the wind more than it should be. I could tell there was some stuff on the ground by the tent, and I remember saying how weird that was. As we got closer, we could see that the tent door was hanging unzipped and flapping around. The stuff on the ground was our gear, sleeping bags and clothes. We thought someone robbed us. We knew we hadn't left any food unsecured, and it didn't seem like an animal's work because the zippers were just pulled down like a person would do. Inside the tent, there were muddy prints all over the ground cover and tarp. If I didn't know better, I would have thought they were from a giant dog. 
Our bags had been opened and all contents had been removed and thrown around. All the food locked inside the cooler was missing and everything was covered in sand and mud. We were totally astonished, and then I noticed that growl I heard the night before. I was instantly terrified. I can't tell you how primal it sounds. My roommate and I rushed out and heard it coming towards us as it came from behind the trees. We both screamed when we saw this huge werewolf-like creature. It was obviously eating something and looked like a six or seven foot tall wolf, but had a man's torso. It had a long snout and sharp fangs, and when it howled it sounded like a human scream. It was facing sideways from us, so I couldn't really see its eyes. However, its back was kind of hunched over, and it had massive shoulders. It never looked at us. It finished what it ate, and then turned away and disappeared into the trees. We were literally shaken from seeing that thing. We knew we had to leave. Abe. We pulled everything out of the tent and shook it off as best we could. We threw everything in the trunk and raced out of there. We stopped at the ranger station, but it was after hours and nobody was around. We didn't know what to do and went home. I called them the next day to describe what we had seen. I have no idea if they took me seriously or if they thought we were just seeing things. I'm a pretty big skeptic of anything supernatural, and I have a firm belief that everything can be explained by science. So I can't recall anything but one incident. It happened about 18 years ago. My wife's parents' house is a ranch house that is carved into the side of a hill. In their basement, they have a nice wood-burning stove and a big old comfy couch and some crocheted comforters that are amazing. It was Thanksgiving, and we had just eaten. I didn't drink back then either. No meds to speak of. Perfectly healthy. It was my wife, her parents, and her two sisters. In classic form, I go downstairs after turkey, dressing, and all matters of food. I curl up on the couch and take a nap. The wood burner was on, but closed, so no noise. The curtains down, there were the light blocking kind, so it was pitch black. Awesome, right? I am snuggled up in this blanket, and I slept for an hour and a half toasty. Just fantastic. I wake up. It, of course, is still pitch black. I stand up and make my move to the light switch. As I start walking there, I hear something. When I say hear something that isn't really a good description, it wasn't like in my ears with a direction. You know how you can tell where a sound is coming from. This sound was coming from inside my head, not my ears. And it was loud the voice which was neither man or woman whispered loudly. Haha, 18 years later, I am getting chills typing this. Juoen. My name obviously is John. I stood there in the dark. Dead still. About five foot from the light switch. Not scared. Confused. Okay, who the hell is down here? Where did that come from? Who was that? I didn't recognize the voice. I waited for it to repeat. I stood there for a minute with no light on. Nothing happened. So I walked the five foot to the light switch and flipped it on. Click. Looked around the basement. Nothing abnormal. I heard the rumbling of people walking around upstairs and talking lightly through the floor. So I put my pants back on and walked up the stairs. My wife, her parents, and two sisters are sitting at the table. So not even thinking. I said to them, Ha ha ha. Very funny whomever was downstairs. They all looked at me, and you could tell the look was totally confused. My family is the jokesters. My wife's family is the serious people. My wife's mom says, John, we were all up here talking. Then it hit me. That voice wasn't them. Then I got serious chills because it didn't make sense. But I was such a skeptic, it couldn't be anything but them up to that point. Then my wife said something about how their cleaning lady had said she heard voices down in her basement a few years back, and the father also said the crazy aunt heard someone down there once. Then there was insane talk about Indian burial grounds and other stuff. I have never experienced that before, and in 18 years haven't again either. Just strange. He'll never figure it out, I am sure.
So two stories, both from my dad, who was an avid outdoors man, hunter, and fisherman. Early bow season, he went out scouting for whitetail. He walked around from dawn till about midday until he came to a large clearing. Inside of this clearing, he noticed what he claims to be hundreds of 55-gallon steel drums cut in half. So being a curious person, he decided to go look unknowingly stumbling into a large marijuana grow operation. According to him, he was like F this and just left. Second story is in rural Alabama once again hunting in a new area. Came to what looked like meadow with tall grass apparently, he stumbled over what looked to be a cross. When we returned to camp an inquiry was made about this, and apparently it was an old slave graveyard. It's just weird how the ghosts of history can sneak up on us in weird ways. So this time I wasn't intending on going a hike or camping or anything like that. I had gone to a state park near my home to just walk on one of the trails they had. So I'm walking along its broad daylight out, maybe one in the afternoon when I noticed a side path going off the trail. Now if you have some experience hiking, you will know about so-called social trails, which are paths made by people to get to interesting sites and such. Well, I figured this was just a forming social trail and go off on it to check out what people are going to see. I don't walk that long or far, far enough that I can't see the established trail anymore, but not so far I can't tell where I am in comparison to the trail, if that makes sense. Well, I come this clearing and in the middle of it is a tiny graveyard, maybe 10 headstones in all. It was surrounded by a simple wooden fence and had an old rotted wood bench in the front of it. First off all, let me tell you about the feeling I got from this place. It was sad. Just so very, very sad, like you know how in Harry Potter they describe the presence of a Dementor being like all the happiness in the world was gone, and you could never feel happiness again. Well, that's what it felt like. I went from being in a fairly good mood to, well, anyways, it was weird. Secondly, the gravestones were old. Some were crumbled and fallen, while others were worn and had plant life grown over them. Naturally, I went over and tried to find dates on the stones. Nine out of ten of the stone's words were worn away, but as luck would have it, the last stone wasn't completely worn. I couldn't read it, but as I felt it, I got the person's death date was July 13, 1817. This graveyard was at least almost 200 years old, probably older due to the state of the other markers. After all of these observations, I decided to pay my respects and be on my way. I stayed a little longer seeing I figured these people hadn't had visitors in a while. There was an old bench that I sat on at the front of this graveyard and rested a moment talking to them for my own comfort, I guess. Some time passes and I figure I've bothered the dead's rest long enough so I leave, find my way back to my trail and continue my walk. Suddenly my phone goes off six, seven times in a row and I check, I have seven new messages. My phone was acting like it had been off for the past ten minutes, and suddenly I had reconnected to it again. Weird, but whatever, probably a weird glitch or something. I finish my walk and stop by the visitor's center to buy something from the vending machine and talk to the park rangers there. I have become friends with one of them up there and asked him about the graveyard. He gave me this really confused look and said there isn't any graveyards within the park. I get a serious look and tell him to stop joking, and he just shrugs repeat there were no graveyards within the park. I then explain to him how I had spent a whole ten minutes sitting at this graveyard. He gets this really confused look this time and said I had been up at the trails for three hours, and he thought I had gone on the ten-mile trail. He saw my car driving past earlier. Checking my phone, I was shocked to see it was 4 p.m. I had been at that graveyard for three hours, and it only felt like it was ten minutes. So turns out my ranger friend has been keeping a logbook of weird experiences and happenings within the park and asked me to write mine. I did and went home. I don't know what happened, guys. Where was I? I'm a biologist, and I had the incredible opportunity to explore the vast wonders of the Amazon rainforest. It was an expedition like no other, surrounded by the lush greenery, diverse wildlife, 
and the constant excitement of identifying various species of plants and animals. Each day brought new discoveries, and I felt like a kid in a never-ending playground of scientific mysteries. As I ventured deeper into the bush, I relished in the joy of identifying trees, birds, monkeys, spiders, and so much more. Every find filled me with exhilaration and a sense of purpose. But then, one fateful day, everything changed. I was following a faint trail through the dense undergrowth when I noticed something peculiar moving in the shadows. Curiosity took over, and I moved cautiously closer, my eyes widening in disbelief as I laid eyes on the strangest creature I'd ever encountered. It was like an alien from another world, a surreal manifestation of the Lovecraftian horrors I'd read about in my spare time. This creature defied any classification. It seemed to possess attributes from multiple phyla and species, stitched together in a bizarre and discomforting amalgamation. Its form was utterly incomprehensible, and my brain struggled to process what my eyes were witnessing. It was as if I had stumbled upon a secret of nature that had never been meant for human eyes. The encounter left me speechless, unable to find the right words to describe this unearthly entity. It was beyond any scientific understanding or known taxonomy. I felt a mix of wonder, fear, and reverence for this enigmatic being that seemed to defy the laws of nature. As a biologist, I had dedicated my life to unraveling the mysteries of the natural world. But this encounter had humbled me beyond measure. It was a reminder that no matter how much we know, the universe is bound to be more vast, complex, and unknowable than we can ever comprehend. For days, I found myself haunted by the image of that creature, the indescribable beast that had forever altered my perception of the world. I couldn't help but wonder if I was the only human who had laid eyes upon it, or if someone else in some obscure corner of academia had stumbled upon a similar enigma. As I continued my journey through the Amazon, my heart pounded with both trepidation and excitement. The Lovecraftian horror I had encountered had shaken the foundations of my understanding, but it had also ignited a spark of unyielding curiosity. Despite my inability to grasp its nature, I knew that this encounter had changed me as a biologist, as a person. In the heart of the Amazon, I learned that there will always be mysteries lurking in the shadows, waiting for the intrepid souls who dare to explore. The discomforting unknown now beckoned me, and I couldn't help but embrace the awe-inspiring grandeur of a world far more vast and inexplicable than I had ever dreamed. My time slip story happened in the summer of 1987. One night, I experienced something that enabled me to see the world through someone else's eyes for no longer than a minute. It scared me senseless at the time, and I have no explanation for the events all those years ago. The backstory is this. My then-girlfriend, we'll call her Helen, lived in a big, former vicarage built around the 1-in-800s, in a small village in Yorkshire, UK, some miles from my hometown. Her father was a wealthy guy who worked for the government. He bought the house for the family to live in a couple of years earlier, and renovated it to bring it back to its former glory. One August weekend, Helen had the house to herself. Her brother and parents were somewhere else. She decided to have a small party. I was instructed to bring my buddy Tim along. It seemed that one of her friends had a thing for him and really wanted to meet him. So the party was me and Tim, my girlfriend and three of her mates from university, one of whom was the reason my friend was reluctantly set up to meet. Okay, so the scene has been set. We turn up with a large quantity of beer and attitude. I did my part by bringing Tim along to meet the girl. However, he then got drunk and embarrassed, and failed to fulfill his expected role of sweeping this very pretty, but rather dull young woman off her feet. He wasn't concerned about romance and enjoyed himself in his own way. We were twenty and that night beer and silliness took over. It was a night I will never forget. By midnight, the girls were all in Helen's bedroom doing what girls do when things happen. They were ganging up together and probably having a group anti-men therapy session. At this point, Tim and I were ready to find somewhere to fall into deep sleep. We decided to worry about facing these disappointed women in the morning. I wasn't drunk, 
but I drunk enough beer and didn't want to drive us home. I suggested we find a bed somewhere in this sprawling, rambling old house. Now imagine a house with maybe 12 rooms upstairs. I knew the door to the bathroom and to Helen's room, but every other door was a mystery. Tim and I walked to the end of a passage and pushed open a door. The room was empty except for two small ancient iron beds squeezed against the wall and a few packing crates. There was no carpet on the floor and no other furniture. It was like a small storeroom, but there were beds and we weren't too fussy. In our sleepy state, we just fell asleep. The next thing I knew, I was sitting up in bed, looking out of the window opposite. The window had five bars, upright bars like an old jail. The sun was streaming into the room and it was blinding me. Outside the window, I could clearly see the branches of a large tree as they moved in what seemed to be a very windy morning. The next thing I realized was that the room was filled with furniture, very old-fashioned furniture. It seemed like a nursery with a rocking horse in the corner, but there was no ceiling electric light. Not sure why I looked up, but I did and remembered there was no light. As I tried to make sense of where I was, I could hear people moving outside the room. I could also hear the distinct sound of china cups and plates chinking as people carried and served food. I tried to get out of my bed, but I was totally paralyzed from the waist down. My legs wouldn't move, and I panicked. I looked to my right, and there was no other bed snoring Tim. I was terrified. A door opened, and a young woman walked into the room. She started speaking to me, but no sound came out of her mouth. She was dressed like a servant from a period movie. There was no kindness or smiles. She came in and spoke to me, no idea what she said, and then left. At this point, I was shaking like a leaf and trying to figure out what to do next. I remember thinking I should check the time. I looked down at my watch and everything went dark. I could hear snoring and my digital watch showed it was 3.10 a.m. Wherever I had been, I was back where I needed to be. I leapt out of bed, felt for the light switch and turned it on. Everything was 1987 again, confirmed by the language from Tim who was woken up by the light. The rest of the night passed without incident. First thing in the morning, I was awoken by the sunlight streaming through the window. This time, there were no bars on the window, no tree limbs bending the shafts of light that streamed into the room. It was just an ordinary window. I went downstairs, leaving Tim to sleep. Once the girls had poured me a coffee, I took it outside into the large garden. I needed to see where the tree had gone, the tree that I saw so clearly a few hours before. Helen and her friends followed me outside and I explained what had happened, that I had seen a huge old tree and bars on the window. The tree was gone. No tree stump anywhere near the building. I saw the small window of our room, and then we saw a rather hungover Tim smiling weakly, waving from the same window, who had heard us talking outside in garden. The story might have ended there. I believe that for a short period of maybe 30-45 seconds, I swapped places with a former occupant of that room at a time when there was no electric light, bars on the window, an old tree beyond the window, and a rather unhappy servant whose voice was on mute. After I told Helen everything, she went quiet and said nothing. Have you ever been to my dad's study? I answered that I had not. She said, follow me, and we walked into a downstairs room where her dad worked and had his den. He collected documents and photographs from the house's history to help him and the architect renovate it to its former glory. She pointed out a set of five old sepia photographs, which were framed on the wall. The earliest dated from about 1880 through maybe 10 years, judging by the ages of the children of presumably the same family. It shows the resident, the local vicar, sitting in the garden with his wife and family. He was dressed in Victorian dresses, sailor suits and starched collars. There were, I think, eight children and one was in an ancient wheelchair. They were all arranged in front of a huge oak tree behind which the window of our time slip room clearly had bars. The boy in the wheelchair looked about 12 and was clearly very disabled. He didn't appear in any of the later photos on the wall, so that's my story. People will say, yeah, the guy had been drinking I had but no amount of German beer in Marlboro's.
there were no drugs involved would cause me to experience what I did. The weirdest thing about the whole event was that it felt hyper real, like everything was turned up on a TV contrast, brightness, color, everything except the volume on the grumpy servant. I will never forget how terrifying the whole thing was to me. I haven't had anything like that happen to me again, nor do I want to repeat it. My experience left me fascinated by the time slip stories that I know you enjoy. However, I had a genuine wish to never again pass through whatever dimensional or time-space curtain exists, and it really does exist. I work as a park ranger in a state-run park in Appalachia. It's a little over 5,000 acres with a large lake on the property, which draws in many boaters and fishermen. There are many hiking or walking or horseback trails along with several campground areas, both primitive and not, two old cemeteries and a dilapidated church that held its last service in 1943. My colleagues and I are a small team of five along with our head warden. I am one of the full-time rangers, so I'm here all the time and can confidently say I know the trails and sections like the back of my hand. I've been doing this for just over seven years, which doesn't seem too long, but for the size of the park, I'm confident in my ability to do my job. However, things get strange, horrifying, and tragic quite often around here. Around when I first started my career with the park, I had my first encounter with something strange. We don't have gates to keep people out, nor do we charge admission, so we stay open pretty late usually till 10 p.m. since there are often people camping anyways. We just try to keep the average park goers away after late. If the weather is nice, I will usually take my horse to patrol instead of my PV, personal vehicle. I can sneak up on people better that way. You'd be surprised how many people get freaked out over someone walking up to them on horseback after dark. Always gives me a chuckle when it's some tough kid trying to impress a girl. He turns and sees a huge dark figure and yells, oh shit, or something of the sort. Nearly soils his pants, that kind of thing. Anyway, this particular night was amazing, so I saddled up on Brave my noble steed and did my rounds. The problem areas with after-hours trespassers are usually the cemeteries and the old church, which is on the grounds of the larger cemetery. The other cemetery is a bit smaller and much older and sits way out in the forest. People gravitate to the one with the church because, while it's close to the road, it's large enough to hide in if you hear a peavey coming, plus it's real hilly and surrounded by thick woods. The cemetery is just a short ways from our station, so the ride was only a few minutes. I came up over a hill in the road and saw a car, plastered with band stickers, parked in the small lot in front of the church. I knew then that there was probably a group of teens in the cemetery trying to scare the crap out of each other. Leaving Brave hitched on the fence by the car, I scanned the cemetery and didn't readily see anyone however, it's pitch black and there are no lights there. No electricity running anywhere near the place. I radioed to my boss at the station that I had people in the church cemetery and would let him know when they were on their way. He confirmed. I silently made my way through the tombstones, hoping to spot the group before I actually had to start yelling out over the graves in my best authoritative voice. Plus, part of me is a bit of a bully, and I love to scare the shit out of people in the middle of the night by sneaking up and confronting them when they least expect it. It didn't take me long before I spotted some faint lights over by the edge of the cemetery, near the unknown Civil War soldiers' graves. It was a group of five girls. I started walking toward them, and they must have heard me because they all turned in my direction and two screamed. I suppressed a laugh. I turned on my flashlight and lit them all up. All right, girls, fun's over. You know you can't be in here this late. They seemed relieved to find I was just a person. When I finally reached them, I noticed that they were all silent. It felt creepy and awkward, but then again we were all standing in a dark cemetery. Let's move. Come on. I pressed. They slowly started walking toward the parking lot ahead of me. As we walked, I realized that something seemed off. The night was calm and slightly cool with no wind. 
It finally dawned on me that there was no sound whatsoever. No late night owls, no crickets, frogs, or other fauna. Nothing which is crazy around here. The frogs will normally drive you mad with their calls at night. I think we all jumped when there was a loud pop sound from the forest to the left of us. The girls froze and huddled around me. It is at this time that I will mention I am also a lady, and at the time of this story was not many years older than these girls. So I felt like an awkward mother hen amidst them. Another pop. It sounded to me like large limbs were being snapped off trees like twigs. I shined my light over by the tree line and one of the girls hissed out. Stop. I instinctively dropped the beam toward my feet. What? I asked. One of them shoved a point-and-shoot camera into my hand with an image on the little screen. I was confused as I tried to process what I was seeing. They had taken a shot of the forest with the flash on. The whole image was still nearly black, but I could see the trunks up into the canopies. Then a shiver involuntarily shook through me. There were at least a dozen large sets of big red glowing eyes reflecting from the flash. I'm talking basketball-sized eyes all roughly the same height in the trees. I tried to process this in my head, but another louder wooden pop shattered the air, and the six of us were bolting for the parking lot. Brave was visibly freaking out, ripping and pulling at the reins I tied to the fence. The girls jumped in their car. I could still hear the loud popping noise getting closer. It was definitely wood, like the sound a tree makes when it falls, creating a loud, splintering crack. I tried to think of what it could be. I looked down at the camera I had in my hands. The photo was still on the screen. Maybe they were just unusually large owls. Maybe one tree had fallen on another and caused some limbs to snap. At this point in my time at the park, I was still pretty good at convincing myself to remain realistic. I turned back toward the woods, held the camera up, and snapped another picture. The large red orbs were now all down by our end of the forest near the parking lot, still as high up as the canopies and staring our direction. I found it odd how calm I was as I walked over to the car the girls were in. I handed the camera to the driver, who had rolled her window down. I untied Brave and scooted the hell out of there. Brave was all too happy to oblige. I glanced behind me to make sure the girls were leaving. They were on our heels. I had hoped they'd come to the station to file a report with me, but when I noticed them haul ass out the park entrance, I couldn't exactly blame them. When I tried talking to my boss about it, he assured me it was just some dead trees finally succumbing to gravity and the eyes were most likely owls. It was pretty easy to convince me since I was already thinking they had been owls. I still make sure I never go back into that cemetery at night. If there are people in there, I have since made it a point to yell out to get their attention and let them come to me. Yes, it's cowardly, but I can't shake the feeling that those glowing eyes would still be there if you flashed a light over the dark forest. I hope that by posting this, maybe another fellow officer will read this and open up about some of the more sensitive things in their own life. I was partnered with a fellow officer who would always tell me these stories about how he was seeing this thing all over the place. He said he saw it by the 7-Eleven, and then again by an abandoned house that used to be a meth house. Finally, this thing had apparently followed him outside of town into the swamps and forest. I never once thought he was making any of it up, because you know he's my partner, that's not his style. He's very serious. But I begin to notice things along with him as well. At first, it wasn't anything major, but just odd little things that you'd see for a split second, usually when you're driving through unpopulated rural areas at nighttime. Other officers had told me that they too had been seeing something strange around their patrol zones, but were hesitant on speaking up. One night, my partner said that he was going to follow whatever it was into the forest. I was already nervous about the area of Florida because people have talked about seeing some really weird things there in the years. I tried talking him out of it, but he insisted on going anyway, so I went with him. A few blocks away from the edge of the forest, I told him to stop and park by a remote two-story house on a street corner. He parked right next to it, 
cut his engine off, and we sat there in silence for roughly three to five minutes. Then we heard this blood-curdling roar coming from nearby in the marshes, and my partner looks behind us and screams, Oh no! Then he turns the engine back on and peels out of there like a bat out of hell. I never did find out what he saw behind us. I didn't find out until after he'd retired that he'd seen what was making those roars, and he claims it wasn't human. I hope the department never puts him in a position to have to shoot one. I can only assume they're big, tough, and mean, but again, if there were anything like this when he saw it, who knows how much good a gun would do. If this is maybe something like a skunk ape, I'm also willing to bet that all the strange creatures out there are smart enough to not attack him after what he must have done. That's all for now, folks, but if you want to discuss this in private, go ahead and send me a PM. I'd be more than happy and willing to discuss this. This story was shared to me probably a little over a year ago by a U.S. Border Control agent who obviously wanted to remain anonymous. Some of the stories he shared with me about working on the southern border were interesting, including some Bigfoot-type encounters. But the first incident that he experienced was with a dogman. This occurred when he was still training for his job. It really shook him because he had never seen anything like it before. So he drove around with a senior co-worker, a field training officer. They were in their Ford truck driving around, showing him the checkpoints and hotspots where they usually find people illegally crossing the border. I believe he said he was working 10 or 12 hour shifts. This was at the Arizona-California border where it intersects with the Mexico border. One night, while he was still fairly new, he actually had a cold and wasn't feeling very well. They were traveling on a dirt road, which was part of their normal routine. They didn't see any signs of people which they thought was a little odd, because he says he always sees trash, water bottles, or clothes or something out there. They got to the turnaround and flipped on their spotlights. They didn't really see anything, and as they're turning around the headlights and the spotlights illuminated something in the distance, his training officer looked over and said, oh, that's probably just a wild animal. We should we go take a look? They get closer, and I guess at this point the terrain got kind of rough. He slowly drove forward. While observing this animal, they could tell that it had dark black fur, but weren't sure what they were looking at. Maybe we should just leave it alone. He was really urging the training officer that they should get out there. His response was, no, we need to go check it out. Then it clicked with the training officer that something wasn't right. It looked like a bear hunched over while eating something. They got within 30 yards of it, a good distance, but still close enough that they could see what was going on. At this point, they flipped on another set of bright lights from the light bar on the cab roof. This creature lit up, then it stood up. He thought it was a giant man with a fur coat. But as it turned around, he noticed that it had this dog's head, like a wolf's head. It was all black and you could see the eyes. The eye shine was reflecting an amber tint. It was very muscular and had broad shoulders. It was way too huge to be a dog or wolf. Then it stood up on its back legs. He immediately stopped the truck as they watched this upright canine looking at them. After several seconds, this dogman eventually took a step towards them. Then it took another step and it was closing distance. It wasn't walking fast, but its strides were so huge, and it was getting closer and closer. He threw the truck into reverse. The dogman opened its mouth a little bit and hunched over, like it was sizing up prey. He quickly turned the truck around and drove away from the creature. He looks in the rearview mirror. He could still see the dogman illuminated by the red rear lights. He said he had never seen anything like that. It scared the crap out of him. They directly drove back to the station. His training officer said that it was just Big Dog, but don't talk about it with anyone. They didn't mention it in their nightly report. Occasionally, you'll pick up migrants that will talk about the Lobos or the Big Hairy Man and other strange stuff in the desert. Me and my girlfriend at the time went camping deep in the Everglades. 
We took a dirt road off the Tamiami Trail at the 40-mile bend and headed straight south into Big Cypress Preserve. After passing a few strange private properties, an old Volkswagen full of mannequins, 15-foot fences with no trespassing signs, etc., we found a campsite that was part of the preserve about 30 minutes later. We set up camp and my girlfriend points to a tiny overgrown trail leading back into the woods. I grab my machete, start clearing the path and start hiking along this old trail with her right behind me. We probably blaze that trail for about a mile and a half before she stops me. I look up and there's this old double wide trailer a few yards off the trail up ahead. The walls and floor had mostly fallen through and was totally destroyed. After looking through it, we kept walking. I'm looking down, hacking away with my machete, and she stops me again. There was this small cinder block shelter off the trail to the right. By this point, I'm getting creeped out trying to figure out the logistics of someone building a shelter of cinder block or bringing a double wide that deep into the woods. We were miles from any roads, and we are in a swamp. It just didn't make sense. We kept walking, see more shelters, and all of a sudden the woods open up into this clearing. The shelters we had been seeing surrounded the clearing, making a circle, and there were old 70s-style clothes on the ground, old bottles and cans, and different small tools in each shelter. We turned around, looked up, and saw these two H-beams raised on series of pillars, making a railroad track that traveled above the brush from way off in the distance and ended at this site. Thoroughly creeped out, we started to circle back toward our campsite before I hear my girlfriend call me over. There was a single-engine airplane with bullet holes down the side turned over in the brush. We checked out the plane and got the hell out. About two years ago now, a friend and I were driving around some dirt roads in rural Georgia. Miles out from any civilization, we were just driving because he had plenty of gas and we were bored. Anyways, we turn off the road we were on to check another road. And as soon as we're on it, standing right in the middle of the road, dead ahead of us, about five yards from the gate is a massive white cat. We're talking mountain lion size, but fluffy like a bobcat and snow white. Of course, my reaction was to ask him if he was seeing what I was seeing, because what I was seeing was a giant albino bobcat. After about five whole minutes of making sure we were on the same page and not hallucinating, during which it just sat there, naturally we pull a little closer to get a better look at it. The thing just stared at us, so we go to get out of the truck. As soon as we opened the doors, it trotted to the other side of the gate and stood there continuing to watch us like it knew we were completely foiled by that gate. We still go out off those woods a few times a year to try and find it again, but it has been to no avail since. Still, an amazing experience we'll never forget though. I was backpacking the river to river trail alone and was staying the night at one horse gap in Shawnee Forest. I set up my campsite and did a little exploring around the area walking along a cliff edge. I came back, started a fire, and ate some crappy freeze-dried meal. It's almost 10 and I'm looking at the stars and I hear from the area. I was exploring earlier this loud animal noise. It sounded like a monkey howling. I'm not an expert in animal sounds, but I do know most of the sounds in that area, since I hiked them quite frequently, and I had no idea what it was. I went into my tent shortly after and started to go to sleep when I heard, probably within 100 feet of my tent, a sound like a single big footstep. No worries, probably a deer. Then I heard it again a few minutes later and again a few minutes later. Then I heard several steps back to back getting closer. My mind was racing what it could be, but since I was alone I was prone to freak out a little more. So I just told myself to calm down, it's just a deer. Then I hear the noise of something dropping on the rock I'm camping on. I'm on the side of a small cliff and the tree line is about 10 feet away. Then I hear it again. It sounded like rock hitting rock, like the rocks were getting thrown at me. It happened a few more times and then one hit my tent. At that moment, I'm convinced it's a Sam Squatch. I peek out the netting at the top of my tent and scream as loud as I can, hey. 
After that I didn't hear anything, rocks or footsteps. And I just wanted to go to sleep so I wouldn't freak out anymore. I told myself it just had to be acorns falling from the trees and eventually got to sleep. So the next morning I got out of my tent and inspected the ground. There are no acorns or pine cones or anything but rocks on the ground. I'm still telling myself it couldn't have been the rocks because they would have to have been thrown. But I pick up a rock, throw it in the air, and let it hit. And it was the exact same noise I heard the night before. I packed it up and noped out of there. I'll never forget that day at work when my co-workers and I found ourselves discussing paranormal experiences. It had been an unusually slow day at the deli with hardly any customers, so we decided to share some spooky stories to pass the time. One of the deli workers had a particularly chilling story to tell. He recounted an incident that had taken place about a year back when he and several friends were having a BBQ and decided to spend the night at his house. The way he told the story made my spine tingle with anticipation. According to him, they were all gathered on the back porch, just enjoying each other's company and talking late into the night. Everything seemed perfectly ordinary until, out of nowhere, one of his friends let out a startled yell and pointed towards the tree line. All eyes turned to where his friend was pointing, and there, standing by a tree, they saw what appeared to be a human figure. The atmosphere on the porch suddenly shifted, and a sense of unease settled over the group. They were all frozen in place, trying to make sense of what they were seeing. But the terror didn't end there. In a matter of seconds, the human figure seemed to transform into a canine shape right before their eyes. The creature vanished into the woods, leaving the group dumbfounded and shaken. The deli worker who had shared the story swore that none of them were drunk, or under the influence of any substances. They didn't want to behave recklessly around the children who were also present at the gathering. As I listened to his story, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of fear and fascination. It sounded like something straight out of a horror movie. I could only imagine the fear and confusion they must have experienced at that moment. After hearing this tale, the curiosity in our group grew and we couldn't help but wonder what they had encountered that fateful night. Was it a trick of the light, an optical illusion, or something more supernatural? We couldn't say for sure, but one thing was certain. There was something eerie and unexplainable lurking in those woods. As the day at the deli continued, we often found ourselves glancing towards the tree line, half expecting to catch a glimpse of the enigmatic figure ourselves. The deli worker's story left a lasting impression on all of us, and we were left with the haunting question what could possibly take on the form of both a human and a canine. The mystery remained unsolved, and we could only wonder if there were more secrets hidden in the darkness of that forest, waiting to be discovered by unsuspecting eyes. We were investigating a campsite surrounded by blood and lots of reported Bigfoot activity. As we were patrolling the area on the lookout for any suspicious activity, we heard something heavy crawling through the brush, breaking branches as it moved. It stopped once we turned off our lights, and we could hear something right beside us. It was breathing very heavily, making strange noises, and suddenly we see this large dark shape jumping right between my partner and me. Before turning around to face us, it was at least eight feet tall, about five feet wide, and had yellow glowing eyes in the darkness. It stared us down intensely for a moment before turning and running off into the woods after it realized it had been spotted. I don't think it expected us to be there. We searched for footprints or anything else beyond being completely terrified about what we had just seen. But we knew our job meant that we had to follow it and find out who or what it was. My partner and I just kept looking at each other in disbelief after seeing what a creature this was. Clearly, there was nothing about this that was human in any way, shape, or form. The strange part, though, is that even though we did report this incident to our higher-ups, they didn't seem the least bit concerned. They talked as if they knew something but weren't going to tell us. Anyway, if you manage to get your hands on any sort of Bigfoot encounters or stories, I would love to read them and try to educate myself on what it is that we saw.
And don't get me wrong, my partner and I were completely horrified by this still am. It's still rough to talk about, but I figured I have to at least come to terms with it. We're very lucky that this large animal didn't attack us and kill us. The night was unusually dark as I drove my truck along the highway in Arizona, transporting wood logs to my next destination. The only source of light came from the headlights cutting through the blackness, creating a tunnel of visibility ahead. The vast expanse of desert stretched out on either side, casting eerie shadows under the moonless sky. As I continued down the lonely road, my thoughts drifted away, consumed by the rhythmic hum of the engine and the monotony of the journey. However, a sudden glimmer of two glowing lights in the distance jolted me back to full alertness. Curiosity peaked. I wondered if it was another vehicle, or perhaps some sort of roadside emergency. As I drew closer, my heart began to race, and a sense of dread washed over me. There on the deserted highway, stumbling and waddling, was a grotesque creature. Its movements were awkward, dragging one of its legs with each step and it seemed to be engrossed in its own actions. The sight of it made me cringe and shudder, as if a primal instinct within me recognized the unnatural and dangerous presence before me. The creature's facial features, what little I could discern from the distance, were enough to make my stomach drop to my ass. It appeared male, but its face was a horrifying sight to behold. The creature's disfigured jaw hung open, making its already ghastly skinny face appear even more unsettling. Deep, dark eye bags gave its eye sockets an empty, soulless look, and its mouth stretched wide open, creating a hauntingly hollow expression. I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was staring into the depths of my soul. As I approached, other horrifying physical attributes became apparent. The creature had no clothes, its deathly skinny frame almost skeletal in appearance. Its height was unnaturally tall, even freakishly so, and its body was covered in layers of dirt and grime. Though hard to make out in the dim light, I could tell it probably looked white. Feeling an overpowering mix of fear and morbid curiosity, I instinctively pulled my truck to a stop. My eyes widened as I saw the creature devouring a deer right there on the road. It tore at the carcass with a savage hunger making my skin crawl and my mind scream at me to drive away. But before I could react, the creature noticed me, its head snapping up to face my direction. It was as if the beast had sensed my presence all along and was now ready to confront the intruder. My heart hammered in my chest and panic surged through my veins. In that heart-stopping moment, I knew I had to get out of there. With trembling hands, I turned the key in the ignition, revving up the engine. The creature's chilling shrieks echoed through the night as it ran towards me with unnatural speed. Fear gripped me like a vise, and without hesitation, I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, the tires screeching as the truck shot forward. The creature lunged towards me, its grotesque features contorting with rage, but I was already accelerating away from that nightmarish sight. My heart didn't settle until I had put a considerable distance between myself and that horror. My breaths came in ragged gasps as I drove on, adrenaline coursing through my veins. What had I just witnessed? I was about two weeks into a solo three-week hike, crossing some low hills between one watershed and another. There was a little lake up in the hills, well off the beaten track, and I hadn't seen anyone for a couple of days. As I came down to the lake, I noticed a horse's saddle slung over the branch of a tree. Weird, because there were no horses or anyone at all around. It wasn't cracked, looked to be in good condition, but it seemed to have been abandoned. I walked along the shores of the lake for a while. As I rounded a bush, I came across the darndest sight. A dead horse on its back, with all four legs sticking straight up into the air. If you've ever seen the movie Animal House, it was like the horse that died in the Dean's office. It can't have been dead long as it hadn't started to decompose that I could see, even though it was hot summer weather. Presumably the saddle had come from the horse. But why was it up in a tree, maybe half a kilometer away from the horse? And how had the horse died in such a weird position? And what had happened to the rider? I 
I had just graduated from the police academy within six months when I had my very own sighting, and I still have yet to report it to my superiors. I was still in town on an early evening, on my way to meet up with some friends. I was stopped at a red light as the orange and yellow of the suns began to vanish behind the line of trees on the horizon. I noticed out of my driver's side window, this large creature coming up alongside me. It looked like it had just crawled down from the hills and seemed to be trying to cross or travel as we both reached this intersection. It started watching me inside my car as I drove away and stayed next to me for at least a few miles before its size made it disappear into the darkening sky. The best way that I know how to describe it is that it looked like a half gargoyle, half human with black leathery skin, a long tail with the shape of a whip, and a kind of spade shape at the end. It appeared to have horns and sharp claws, but still looked very human in nature, wearing nothing more than what appeared to be a loincloth or possibly just a flap of black skin that was revealed when it crouched down. As you can imagine, I drove home in complete shock and disbelief, but could do nothing to get the image out of my head. This thing flew about 30 to 50 feet above the ground the entire time, completely visible to anybody in eye shot. What made things worse was that there was not another person around anywhere for miles, which meant I could not get an explanation from anybody. This thing seemed to have been watching me as if it knew what I was thinking and where I was going. Since this encounter, many strange events have occurred, keeping me away from the location where I saw it years ago, including hearing things outside my window and seeing very bizarre things out in the woods. I tried to pick up the trail again after moving, but after a couple of days, things started appearing inside my house as well as knocking on my doors and windows. It's almost as if it has followed me completely. The only thing that I know is that these beings are truly evil and need to be stopped. I feel like they've crossed over into our dimension and are even more monstrous than before. When I first got onto Reddit, I was hesitant about telling people what happened to me at night but I ended up deciding that this would be the best place because I could be anonymous and fully express what I experienced. This is not a joke or fake, nor am I looking for any kind of attention, notoriety, or fame. I don't want any upvotes, none of that. I truly hope that by writing this, someone somewhere will be able to help me, and I really need it. Thank you for your time, and thank you if you were able to read all of this. Oh, and one last thing I wanted to include, I don't think this has anything to do with demons or devils. I've seen a lot of people say this online, although it feels very similar. It is not something that appears in any religious text to my knowledge, and certainly nothing that you would want to encounter up close and personal. I never expected my solo hunting trip in the secluded forests of Arizona to take such a terrifying turn. The idea was to hunt wild deer, but little did I know that I'd end up facing an unknown creature that seemed like something out of a nightmare. Venturing deep into the woods, I followed the path that led me further away from sunlight. The forest became dense, and shadows enveloped everything around me. My instincts told me to turn back, but my determination pushed me forward. As I pressed on, my senses heightened, and I caught a glimpse of movement in the distance. My heart pounded in my chest as I focused my gaze. My eyes widened in disbelief and fear as I saw what I can only describe as a monstrous entity. It stood upright on its two hind legs, and its thin, emaciated frame sent chills down my spine. Its arms were disproportionately long, almost touching the ground, resembling a gorilla trying to conceal its true height. The creature's eerie gaze locked onto mine, and I could see its crooked spine and deformed face without any horns. Instead, it had neck hair that resembled a fake mane, and its skin appeared moonlight gray, reflecting an unsettling shine in its eyes. I instinctively raised my rifle, my hands trembling as I aimed at the grotesque figure. The adrenaline coursing through my veins was the only thing keeping me steady. With a deep breath, I pulled the trigger, the gunshot echoing through the forest. But to my shock and horror, the creature sensed the danger and managed to dodge the bullet with unnatural speed and agility. Before I could react, the creature rushed towards me with incredible force. It tackled me to the ground, 
and I felt an excruciating pain in my side as I hit a protruding rock. Struggling to get back on my feet, I watched helplessly as the creature disappeared into the dark depths of the forest. Injured and shaken, I managed to pull out my phone and call for help. The park rangers came to my rescue, finding me battered and bewildered. They asked what had attacked me, and without hesitation, I described the chilling encounter in detail. The rangers exchanged skeptical glances, and I could sense that they didn't believe me entirely. They knew these woods like the back of their hands and had never come across any creature fitting my description. Perhaps they thought my injuries had clouded my judgment, or that I had seen a bear or some other wildlife. Regardless, they patched me up and took me back to safety. My mind kept replaying the horrifying image of that creature. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this mysterious encounter than anyone was willing to accept. Four years ago, an unforgettable hunting trip took place, etched in my memory like a vivid painting. I was accompanied by my trusted companions, Uncle Jack, my brother Larry, and Frankie of Warm Springs. May he rest in peace. The season was perfect for elk hunting, with October-November casting a beautiful blend of colors over the landscape. Our destination was the wilderness near Mount Hood, a realm of nature's untamed majesty. We ventured off the beaten path, leaving the main road behind at the Bear Springs Ranger Station, and journeyed across the rugged ridges toward the McQuinn Strip, an addition of the Warm Springs Reservation. As we trekked through the dense forests and embraced the solitude of the wild, little did we know that an awe-inspiring and terrifying encounter awaited us. In the distance, around 800 yards away, we spotted an astonishing sight two big feet in a meadow. Our hearts pounded with both amazement and trepidation. The massive creatures had apparently taken down an elk and were feasting on its flesh, tearing off chunks with ease. It was a sight that defied belief mythical beings, as real as the wilderness surrounding us. As we watched through our rifle scopes, captivated by the scene unfolding before our eyes, another Bigfoot emerged from the brush to join the group. Moments later, a fourth one appeared, smaller in stature, but still an impressive five feet in height. The big feet ranged from seven feet tall to the smaller one at five feet, their presence alone enough to send shivers down our spines. While we were in awe of these magnificent creatures, our primal instincts kicked in, and we felt a growing concern for our own safety. If these majestic beings could so effortlessly take down an elk, could we be their next target? The idea of being on their menu for dessert was enough to send a chill down our spines, and with that realization, we chose to retreat. As we made our way back, Uncle Jack shared a story that added to the sense of awe and fear surrounding these mysterious beings. He recounted how a friend had witnessed Big Feet herding deer for the kill, illustrating their intelligence and cunning in securing a high-protein diet that sustained their impressive size, strength, agility, and speed. Our minds were swirling with questions and emotions as we hiked out of the wilderness. The encounter had left us both amazed and terrified, forever altering our perception of the untamed world around us. We had been privileged to glimpse these elusive giants of the forest, and yet the lingering fear of what they were capable of haunted our thoughts. Since that fateful day, we continued our hunting trips, but the memory of the big feet remained etched in our minds, a constant reminder that the wild had secrets beyond our understanding. I was in the Marine Corps for about six years. When I got out, I worked for several different companies with the government. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I was not emotionally or financially stable enough to re-enter the civilian world. So after talking to somebody in the Department of Defense, I took a job at this particular base. I did know what I was getting into, but I knew it would be better than jumping out of a plane or simply blowing things up. I had heard rumors about strange bases and all kinds of top-secret projects over the years, but I never saw any proof of their existence until I began working on this particular base. It was a hot base, meaning that we had active duty personnel as well as contractors working there. The first couple of months were all pretty uneventful, 
except for the fact that my security clearance kept getting higher and higher. I was working in a very small office with only six desks in the room with five other people. I was the low man on the totem pole, so I got stuck in the back room with no windows. The walls must have been soundproofed with foam. Whenever somebody slammed a file cabinet door or dropped something on their desk, it sounded like a bomb going off. One day, my boss told me to follow him, and he took me down a series of hallways until we got to a special room. Inside this room were shelves and shelves of computers and what looked like either contraptions made out of metal or other materials. He informed me that these were real alien artifacts from a crash site located in Roswell, New Mexico. These were replicas from the late 1940s, and they looked pretty new. I have no idea how they made these or got these, but they also had several other replicas and models of other devices built by engineers who had studied them. I kept asking my boss questions about these artifacts, but he kept brushing me off and would tell me to focus on the work. I couldn't stop thinking about them, so I tried to do some digging on my own. It was not very long before I started finding my own things. We had several different projects going on, and everybody worked in a cubicle with a desk, a chair, and a computer. On the opposite wall of the room were several bulletin boards with different memos, white papers, and reminders. I was at my desk one day looking for a copy of an email when I noticed that there were several memos up there, top secret ones, and they did not have the clearance level next to them. It was the titles of these memos that struck me as odd, so I decided to print them off and take them back to my desk. I will list the titles. I have no idea what they mean. Project Grudge, Operation Bluefly, Magic 12. The project names intrigued me, so I printed them off and took them back to my desk. I opened up Google and typed in Project Grudge and Operation Bluefly. The only thing that came up were people asking what these projects were, and conspiracy theorists saying they were watching them. To make a long story short, I spent hours and hours looking through various government documents, especially anything that had to do with projects related to aliens. My curiosity was driving me crazy. To say that I got to talking to it was a bit of an understatement. Shortly after, I was monitored, and I had a talking to for observing and looking over these documents. I was actually transferred to a base across the country with all my clearance redacted. I was told the entire reason I was transferred was due to a bad attitude and not complying with my job. Of course, that was on paper, but the real reason was because they were investigating me. They wanted to know what I had found and who I was talking about. What started out as a favor to one of my best friends ended with me being transferred to another state, having to start all over again. Fortunately, I kept copies of everything I'd found, all the documents. About two months after my arrival at the new base, three weeks before I was about to be rotated out of the service, I was called into an interrogation room. I was grilled for about three hours by someone from my old base. I was told that I could not speak of anything I had seen, read, or heard. They also made me sign several non-disclosure agreements and federal documents. My life was threatened if I ever planned on leaking any of this information. I guess we'll see what happens. Now I'm going to go by the name of John Doe for this email. The short of it is this. Don't talk to anybody about anything you see, read, or hear at your job if it is not given to you on a silver platter. Government and military jobs are very dangerous for your mental health, believe me. I don't know what they do to people who talk about the things they know, but I do know what they told me, and I'm going to have to be very careful. My name is Alex, and I used to be a part of one of the most elite Navy SEAL teams. We were known for our unwavering loyalty, dedication, and commitment to serving our country. But something changed, and it shook us to our core. A rogue group of ex-Navy SEALs, disillusioned and bitter, broke away from the path of honor and duty. They formed a deadly mercenary organization, calling themselves Valkyrie and they embraced a life of selling their lethal skills to the highest bidder. The very idea of our former brothers in arms becoming enemies of the state left a bitter taste in our mouths. Their actions were brazen and reckless. 
Valkyrie embarked on a spree of high-profile heists, disrupting peace and threatening global stability. Their targets were high-value assets, and each successful operation fueled their dangerous reputation. As the chaos escalated, our government was left with no choice but to deploy an elite counter-terrorist team, which included me and some of my former comrades, to confront the rogue SEALs. The mission was personal for us, as we felt responsible for bringing our wayward brothers back from the brink. The game of cat and mouse between our teams unfolded across continents, with Valkyries striking with ruthless precision and disappearing into the shadows. The line between friend and foe blurred as we hunted those we once trusted with our lives. Emotions ran high, and loyalties were tested at every turn. With each encounter, it became evident that our former teammates had truly turned into adversaries. Their hearts had grown cold, and their actions proved that they were willing to sacrifice anything for their twisted cause. In Yemen, we received intel that Valkyrie's enigmatic leader, known only as Black Eye, was holed up in a heavily fortified compound. The tension was palpable as we prepared for the final confrontation, knowing that this would be the moment of truth. The compound was a maze of danger, and we moved with utmost caution, aware that any misstep could lead to disaster. The familiar scent of gunpowder filled the air as the sounds of gunfire echoed through the corridors. The faceless enemy we once called our own, now adorned with a Valkyrie insignia, confronted us with relentless fury. It was a battle of wills, skill, and determination. The stakes were high, and we knew that failure was not an option. In the heart of that compound, amidst the chaos of the firefight, I found myself face to face with Black Eye. His eyes were cold and devoid of any semblance of the person I once knew. It was a painful reminder of how far he had fallen. The seconds felt like an eternity as we locked eyes, and then it happened. I pulled the trigger and Black Eye fell, his lifeless body crumpling to the ground. It was a moment of closure, but it also brought with it a heavy burden of regret. The explosive showdown in Yemen marked the end of Valkyrie's reign of terror, but it also left scars on our souls. Our hearts were heavy as we returned home, knowing that we had lost brothers on both sides of the battlefield. I think I had an encounter with Wendigo. My friends and I recently went to Sierra National Forest for a camping trip. About two hours deep for dispersed camping. The day was wonderful. I personally ended up falling asleep fairly early 10 a.m. When I woke up, half my group was in shambles from an unsettling story. Our campsite was all close together. However, one of the individuals slept in a hammock about 50 feet from everyone else's tent. When we woke up, he had us if anyone else heard me scream his name. The strange thing here is I've referred to him by a personal nickname rather than his name for years. He had expressed to us that he heard the yell of his name in my voice around 3 a.m. And it sounded far away, however nobody else heard it. Just thought that was very strange. This happened about two weeks ago, and we're still chatting about it as a collective. I can't tell you what I saw that day, but I can describe it. I lived in Skykomish, Washington for a couple years and was curious about Sasquatch. I've had a couple of experiences, but this was different. I was out for a walk with my dog one afternoon in the summer of 2018 and turned to see something watching us from behind an embankment. It looked like a tree stump. I stopped and stared at this thing for 30 seconds. It had owl-faced features, but it was huge. The head of it was sticking up from behind this embankment, and it was the size of an old growth tree stump. I was close to this thing about 20 feet away. I could see its eyes were closed but squinting to observe me. It almost seemed sloth-like. It had designs that were a cross between bark lines and owl pattern marks. I felt no fear at all. I was staring at it and said, What the hell is that? My dog didn't notice it. After a bit, I looked down and stepped forward without feeling threatened. When I looked back up, it was missing. I stood there for a minute, then got spooked and went home. I walked back to that spot and stood there every day looking for whatever it might have been I saw that day. 
I walked behind the embankment one time and sized it up to be about six feet tall, so whatever I saw was about seven, two, or eight feet tall, I estimate. There are lots of super eerie calls in the area. A lot of Sasquatch. I believe there are other undocumented creatures as well. I have some photos of odd things, but did not have my camera on me that particular day. I live in rural New Mexico, just outside of Albuquerque. Last summer, I was stringing corral fence. A Navajo friend, Tom Bill, visiting while he attended a powwow in Albuquerque, watched as I hammered away at a corner post. The horses began to spook. What's got them stirred up, he asked. I told him that every night coyotes ran down our road, making the dogs bark and the horses go crazy. Then Tom told me a story. One night last April, about 2 a.m., he said, L was driving along the Crown Point Road in my truck when I heard a noise. Seemed at first to be coming from the engine, a strange sound like a dog panting. I got car trouble, I thought. Then I heard a footfall behind me, back over my right shoulder. I looked down at the speedometer, and I was traveling about 55 or 60 miles an hour. I glanced into my rearview mirror, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. There was some guy I'd never seen, a Navajo, and he was running just in back of the tailgate. I couldn't see his face, just his torso lit by my taillights, his arms and legs flying up and down incredibly fast. I sped up to around 75 and looked back. He had disappeared, but I heard a breathing sound right by my left ear. I looked out the window, and there he was, running along, keeping pace with me. As I was looking at him out the window, he veered off toward Crown Point. I knew he was no ordinary man because he was traveling so fast. Just before he disappeared into the brush, he had changed into a wolf. So you better watch out. Those coyotes spooking your horses may not be coyotes. My uncle once told me, and this was a very chilling story, about a time when he and one of my other uncles went deer hunting in the foothills of Mount Taylor. He saw a deer up in some rocks and shot at it. Then he heard a voice, a human voice, somebody calling out his name and crying for him to help. My uncle was seized with fear at the sound of this voice summoning him. Cautiously, he went up there to see what was going on. He saw a man lying on his side, wounded. The man was only half human, the top half, and the rest of him was some kind of animal. I don't know if it was a wolf or not. I think it was a deer, but my uncle knew this was some kind of spirit. He was afraid to come any closer. He felt that it would get him if he approached any nearer. Then the rest of the men came and they said, let's get out of here. This is some kind of witch or spirit that wants to take human form. My uncle told this story in great detail. I was doing survival training for the Air Force and on the second night, not 50 yards from our campsite, I hear gunshots. I've spent a lot of time around guns, so I know what 50 yards sounds like with a handgun or a long gun. This was a smaller caliber handgun, maybe 38 caliber or 9 millimeter. We decided to ignore it as it was probably the cotter doing something to play mind tricks, so we didn't do anything about it. A few days later as we finished, we found out that a man had been shot in the wilderness near us. In the last few years, I have yet to see any news that has to do with the random shooting of a guy near Colorado Springs. It was either in Sailor Park or near USAF grounds. I can't remember exactly due to the amount of training we did. I have been hesitant on posting any story mainly due to the fact that I don't want anyone ever thinking that I or the person the story is about is crazy. Although saying this actually happened sounds very cliche, but I can assure you the following stories are true. Now before I begin the first story, just for a bit of background, I am an intern for a church that does work on a Navajo reservation site helping the community on people's homes like roofing repair, repainting, and interior fixing. 
8-5 with good pay and nice people so overall I'm happy with this. And as a bit of a disclaimer, I'm not trying to offend Navajo tradition in any way. This is just a first-hand story on what is currently happening on my trip. Over the past two months of the internship, I have begun to grow fairly close with some of the residents on the reservation. One lady in particular that I got to know pretty well was the superstitious type, like said never be outside at night or other random seeming things to me like that, but the biggest taboo I knew to never mention, mainly because I was told by my superiors, was Navajo folklore like skinwalkers. However, one day it was very different in the sense that the question was just burning within me. I was on my lunch break after wrapping up painting parts of her house, and she sits next to me on her porch and we talk for a while. But I finally feel comfortable enough to ask her about any folklore about werewolves or anything of that sort. I didn't really expect a response. I thought maybe she'd quickly say no then change the topic, but if anything I was more scared I may offend her. But to my surprise she turns her head looking toward the outside scenery, hesitates, but then says, yes, I know some and I've experienced it too. She proceeded to tell me a description on the apparent equivalent to a werewolf. To paraphrase, she said, werewolves look like normal people but masked in white paint, covering their face, arms, and chest. Their whole body is white as a corpse, covered with black symbols quite possibly related to devil worshiping. More specifically, they are grave diggers and necromancers as well, they dig bodies up only to steal jewelry, although they may perform other acts to corpses as she quickly strayed away from going into too much detail about that point. Werewolves also get their power from the devil. That is how they are able to possess such supernatural strength and endurance. I was surprised to hear this, although I figured werewolves wouldn't look anything like that in Twilight or Scooby-Doo. Although, deep down, even I thought she sounded a bit crazy. Before I could ask more questions about these werewolves, she began to tell me her own interaction with these supernatural beasts, and her story still gives me chills. She explained that one day her and her husband were driving on the curvy roads alongside the mountains only to find a woman with her face covered by her hands, and was kneeling in the middle of the road appearing as though she was crying. The woman looks up towards the car's headlights to reveal the very same white paint and sacrificial symbols mentioned previously. Her husband honked his horn and quickly slams on the brakes only to be too late, and hears the loud cracking sound of the women's bones and the splash of blood all over the windshield. Once her and her husband stopped the car safely and processed what the hell just happened, they quickly run over to the spot where they hit the women. However, once they reached the spot, there was no body, but not only that, there was no trace of blood either. Just as a side note, this part of the reservation had some cliffs, but it was relatively flat land, so it would be obvious to tell where someone is, especially if they just got hit by a car. Puzzled by what the possible explanation could be for this occurrence, her and her husband drove back home trying to neglect the thought that they just witnessed a werewolf. However, being the non-paranormal believers they were at the time, they tried to just close this occurrence off as them just losing their minds. As interesting as her story was, this got me thinking. Is it possible for this werewolf story to be true? Or is this her own way of describing a skinwalker or other supernatural phenomenon because she didn't think I knew what a skinwalker was? This question kept circulating through my head. So as you could expect, the following nights made it harder for me to sleep comfortably. Because of that, during the workdays I would feel more and more mentally drained, almost paranoid. At the end of the week around 6, I was sitting in the car driving back to the church site, and was in the mental state of mind where I was half awake and half asleep. My buddy was driving, and claimed that he wanted to pull over to the gas station that was near the church to grab a couple of snacks to munch on during our debrief time in our cabin. Since I was too tired to argue, I said fine and laid my face against the window and tried to doze off while waiting for my friend. However, I had the weirdest feeling that I was being watched. So naturally I opened my eyes and looked out the window, I saw nothing. However, when I turned my head, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a white figure, just as the woman described previously. I looked back and nothing was there. 
but I swear I saw something. Since it was beginning to get darker outside, I quickly sat up in my seat to readjust my vision. But when I looked back out the window, it was almost as though the figure vanished. Perplexed, I stepped outside the car and looked around, but there was no trace of a creature even existing. My buddy comes back to the car and questions what the heck I was doing. Debating whether or not I should tell him, I decided to just say, Oh, I'm just getting some fresh air. Let's head out. The following days have been even worse for me. My mood is getting worse. I'm feeling way more paranoid that something is out there. And at night I can almost swear that I hear scream in the far distance. Everything outside just looks 100 times scarier too, because there is barely any outside light besides the moonlight so everything has more of an exaggerated appearance. But believe me, I know I sound crazy. But the worst part is that if I tell anyone, they'll think I'm crazy too. So I have been debating whether or not I actually saw the werewolf that the lady described, or if it was just my tired eyes playing tricks on me. I hope someone can find some sort of answer to this werewolf mystery. Also, if you have any similar paranormal stories like this, please share. I am trying my best to become more aware about the paranormal. If I find anything, then I will give future updates about any more encounters or odd discoveries. I'm 31 years old and from central Pennsylvania. But this story takes place back in September of 2008 when I lived in Ohio. At that time, my best friend Sierra and I went to a state park named Hawking Hills in for a day retreat from our busy lives. We had decided on this at random when we first got together early in the morning just after sunrise. It was a nice warm late summer day, and we just got the wild notion to go for a drive to Hawking Hills since the area is well known for its several walking trails, a cave or two, and several waterfalls and running water, creek areas. The day was very warm, maybe roughly 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees Celsius, so we had worn shorts and short sleeve t-shirts. We started down a trail at random and found that part of the trail had been washed out, so we had to take another path, which according to our phone's GPS tool would force us to cross a small country road. As we played with our mobile phones and noted it was roughly 12 noon EST, we happened to be passed by a group of seemingly odd backpackers before we reached the road and one of the people gripped my shoulder and turned me around to warn us to be aware of a washout up ahead. If we were going to take the trail into the woods, instead the person who stopped us let go of my shoulder and recommended we follow the trail nearby which would go next to the forest fire lookout tower instead as it bypassed a small clump of downed brush. As we crossed the road to the tower trail, we noticed there was caution tape all over the fire tower. There was a pungent smell in the air which we could not identify. The windows on top of the tower appeared to be taped up, grimy, and there were flies all over the area. We walked past it, commenting on how odd it was, and continued down the trail we had been recommending to take. But it was one neither of us had noticed before on a previous walk to the area. This trail took us past the fire tower and then cut into the woodlands. As we walked into the forest maybe 1 e 500 feet or 457 meters or so we took notice that no one seemed to be around and in fact, not only did we feel isolated from others, but we felt very chilled without explanation. Sierra pointed it out verbally while I was thinking it, but we just continued walking. Eventually, the air started to get noticeably chillier and damper. This did not seem unusual at first, but as we continued to walk the air seemed to go from warm to what felt like the mid-50s Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius, and we started to shiver. It was also getting darker as we continued forward. At first I thought it was just due to the green leaves on the trees and maybe a passing cloud overhead, but the darkness really did not improve as one expected. As we walked we looked around and there was nothing but trees on all sides, there should have been a forest edge somewhere as the area wasn't really that big, but aside from some hills and tall pine trees, there wasn't a real ending to the woods like we expected as the area tends to be narrow and normally you can see the edges. My friend took out her phone to use her GPS because she instinctively felt lost, but her battery was nearly gone. I took mine out of my back pocket and it had no signal. 
The battery was also near dead and showed EE for the time meaning it couldn't update as it was an older style flip phone with a camera and when set to auto adjust would contact the mobile phone network every 15 minutes. It was only then as the light grew dimmer that I noticed the area seemed very silent, our footsteps, the leaves we stepped on, grass, twigs and our breathing just echoed. Sierra got spooked and I did too. She mentioned it was very out of the ordinary and I agreed, but I couldn't shake this sense of foreboding that something was amiss. I tried to rationalize it, but I really honestly couldn't figure any of it out at all. We just pressed onwards and after going down a small hill and back up it seemed to have gotten a lot darker. The world seemed to have gone from just shadowy to near twilight darkness. My friend grabbed my arm and started freaking out about how weird it got then the air seemed to have gone still and we had a feeling of something wrong. We both took off running looking for an exit. For some odd reason we never thought to turn around at all and just got back the way we came. It never seemed to occur to us as we ran, but the spookiness continued as we could hear our steps echo off the area as things just felt like they grew more gloomy. Then ahead of us down another small dip in the trail, we could see two large honeysuckle bushes on either side of the trail like a gate. We made a mad dash mostly with her pulling me for these bushes, and just as we pushed through the plants something odd happened we were overwhelmed by a change in our surroundings as light, sound and warmth returned all at once. It was like stepping outside of a cold, empty and dark building onto a warm busy street. We stood at the edge of a place known as Ash Cave which has a large waterfall not too far away with a U-shaped cliff. I turned around to look back from where we emerged, and while the bushes were the same the area was so different brighter not silent for sure and warm. In fact, our skin was cold to touch, which just reinforced the facts. We took out our phones and the time had finally updated. It was now 4 p.m. The normal trail would only have taken an hour to walk fully, so it was a loss of three full hours. Logic attempted to set in, and we decided the trail we came up with must have just appeared creepy because there may have been clouds overhead or a storm blew by. But when we went back between the bushes, there was no trail. Nothing looked like it had a few seconds ago. Sierra walked around the bushes twice, and it was the same bright sunny day with no darkness and no trail. We waited, it was blue sky overhead, and we could see the edges of the forest and other people. The trail had simply vanished as if we had never walked it. On returning to the normal trail with the washout, we ended up locating an offshoot path, which took us back past the fire tower. It was here we noticed it was normal looking as the windows were not taped and very clean, and there was no pungent smell. We don't know what it was, but it certainly was creepy. Of course, I jokingly told her later that day over dinner, we had entered the fairy realms by mistake and were lucky to get away. She didn't find that funny, of course, but either way we both felt we should share this with you. And if anyone out there has had a similar experience, perhaps they can provide insight or share their own. The witness and his cousin were out hunting near Johnson City, Tennessee, and were sitting on the side of the wall of a rather large hollow, which consisted of very thick underbrush and lots of evergreen. A larger valley then lead first to a clearing, and then on to a supposed old Indian graveyard. All of the sudden they heard the brush in the hollow below rattling, and they could tell that whatever was making the sounds was rather large. The main witness was armed with a Ruger 1022 rifle with approximately 150 rounds of ammo ready to go. Under his night vision scope he could see what appeared to be a man, but upon further inspection he realized that the man was a creature about 7-8 feet tall, approximately 450 pounds. It was covered with thick black fur and was slimmer than the popular Bigfoot image, almost skinny with a neck. Also protruding on either side of its head were long tapered horns also black in color. On the top of the head also protruded a horn pointing straight up. All horns were approximately 5-6 inch in length and were the same dark color as the creature. The terrified witness emptied a 25 round clip into the creature and then retreated into a nearby cabin about 65 feet away. 
The next morning, they could not find anything except for lots of spent shell casings and bullet holes on a walnut tree. He thought he had struck the creature several times. Nearby animals' traps had been sprung and all the bait extracted. On a nearby ridge, the witnesses located a series of tunnels made up of brush and various sizes of tree limbs, vines, and leaves. They thought it could have been the lair of the beast. Afraid, they returned home. I was camping in remote East Texas with four other guys. We had hiked for a couple of days and were camped in some pretty thick trees. About 20 yards down a hill was a small river which flowed into a nearby lake, which we were hoping to get to the next day. We had all gone down for sleep, but myself and one other guy saw a light from down the hill, a bit to our east. We woke the others as it looked like people, and we were pretty remote. As it got closer, we realized it was a base boat with a floodlight coming up the river. People that lived somewhere on the lake. It is weird though, because we know they don't live upriver anywhere. The river runs into some rough terrain and narrows to the point you couldn't get through with a boat. So they were just coming up the river for no reason at about 1 a.m., with a floodlight scanning both sides of the river. We stay hunkered down and get our one rifle out, just in case. It's creepy because it really does feel like they're looking for somebody on shore, but we are far enough back to not be seen if we stay laying down. As they get close, we hear a woman's voice talking. It sounds strange, like it's not a conversational way of speaking. As they get close, it sounds like she's reciting something. One guy says it's T.S. Elliot. These are backwoods people reciting T.S. Elliot into the dark forest at one in the morning from a base boat. They came by with this woman just reading this crazy shit while shining the light all over, and some giant duck dynasty looking dude silently driving the boat. Scariest part was that they passed and never came back downriver. We took turns keeping watch, although I didn't really sleep at all, then quietly slipped on down the trail in the morning, trying to hide signs we were there. We ended up cutting really wide around the lake to avoid whoever these crazy redneck poetry fans were. When I was maybe seven or eight, I spent the better part of a month at a cabin in the woods with my grandpa and my little cousin. This cabin was up from Fontana Lake in North Carolina. My papa grew up there and was on his way out, and I guess he just wanted to spend time with some of his grandkids and show us what his life was like before he passed. The trip was great, I had an absolute blast, but there was two bizarre events that I still can't fully wrap my head around. There was like a half a mile gravel road that stemmed from an awful one lane road that ended at a dirt trail, which lead to the front porch of the cabin. It was out of the way up in the woods and had no one near it. This cabin is or was small and smelled like mildew. It had a living room, kitchen and bedroom, no bathroom, everything was tiny. You had to either go outside or walk a few miles to the docks. Papa said he'd had problems with bobcats at night climbing around the cabin and yelling so if we heard something strange outside we shouldn't be alarmed. This of course alarmed us. A few nights into the stay around 1.30 a.m. me and my cousin were woken up by a knock on the door. We were asleep in the living room and my papa was in the bedroom. I wasn't about to answer the door and my cousin was freaking the hell out. We waited in paralyzed silence as the knocks continued and got louder until it was basically someone or something kicking the door. Not surprisingly, they didn't wake up my papa. The man's snores were house shaking lie loud, and you'd basically have to slap him to get him up. Once the kick started, the fear induced paralysis wore off and turned into absolute panic. I bolted to the bedroom and shook my papa awoke. Upon hearing the banging at the door, he grabbed his revolver. He then went to the door, and without saying anything just shot a few rounds through the door and went back to bed. My cousin and I didn't sleep after that. The next day my papa simply said, no one has any business being up here. The porch surprisingly was clean, but the dirt path, gravel driveway, and road were blood soaked. The blood went across and down the road and ended near the docks. The police never came, and nothing was ever said about it again. 
I told my mom once after my papa had passed, and she wasn't shocked at all. She even said my papa and his brother shot a pedophile in Mississippi after he tried to prostitute some little girls to them while they were on a fishing trip. My papa was a hard-boiled, stubborn, God-fearing man, and I miss him, even if he did occasionally shoot people. Next up, during the second week, we took a pontoon boat to the dam. Near the shore of the right side of the dam was a dead snake half on land, half and half in the water, seriously 40 plus feet in length. It was easily longer than the boat and bloated. My papa said there was an abandoned zoo, and it probably came from that and had just been living around the lake. Not so much mysterious or creepy, but definitely weird. When I was a kid 10-12, maybe there was this really old creepy house just round the corner from me. I lived in a fairly nice area, and this house was just old and had stained net curtains and a cracked front door and all the works. The guy worked irregular shifts, so nobody ever really saw him. But other kids would tell stories that they saw him coming home in the early hours with dead animals and bloody knives. Obviously, the rest of us laughed it off as BS. Anyway, one summer we were all bored and decided to sneak past the factories round the back of his house and onto a patch of grass to try to get a look through his back garden. To get there you had to sneak past these buildings, through a bunch of trees, and then through a mesh fence that we had to climb over. Not an accessible place at all, and no other way to get to it. Four of us made the trip, and took turns to bunk each other up to get a look over the fence. I went last and could see my other friends were creeped the F out. There were two dead cats hanging from his tree by their tails with a bunch of doll's heads tied up off the branches and swinging around in the breeze. I could just about see into the house and there were no lights on and a few candles lit in a circle on his floor. My friend swears he saw a limp human leg put in the doorway but none of the rest of us did. Just as I got a good look, the gate opened and the guy came strolling out casual as F, with a bloody machete in his hand. We ran, he chased. We all leaped over the mesh fence, and then he was gone. Never saw him again. I still have no idea what he was up to, and we never told anyone for fear of getting in trouble for what we did. Prior to joining the U.S. Navy, my grandfather took me aside and told me several stories of his time spent in the Navy during World War II. It was his way of ensuring I knew what I was getting into. My grandfather was a weapons technician 2WT2 aboard the destroyer USS Maury DD-401 from 1942-1945 and manned a 538 caliber cannon. He survived Pearl Harbor, battle over Taroa, Battle of Midway and the invasion of Luzon to name a few. With only a small shrapnel wound to his leg in all that time. I'd like to share one of those stories of his though as it just blows my mind to this day. The Mori was escorting an HMAS Australian vessel to Espiritu Santo as Japanese forces were still active in the area and Allied forces were actively attempting to keep Guadalcanal and the Solomon secure after previous weeks of battle with the Japanese forces. The night was clear, with every star in the sky. The wind was so low that you could hear gulls fishing off in the distance and the wakes splashing against the hulls of the ships. The air felt like Hawaii in spring and all you wanted to do was bask in the moon glow. Suddenly, voice radio communications from nearby Allied island bases starting chirping away with information about visual confirmation of enemy subs in the area to the north. Soon after, all on deck order was given and everyone was forced stand ready. A team was assigned light patrol, and they began panning around, looking for subs. Not more than two hours goes by with no visual contact made, they are finally given order to stand down and return to shut-eye duty. A few hours before daybreak, contacts from Nendo Island start coming on voice comms warning that potentials are flying around in the area just five miles south of Mori's escort position. Already worried that they may have been targeted by Japanese subs from their bow, they now have to contend with potential aerial assault, and everyone is called to stand ready once more. Engines are killed, emergency lights activated and orders given to kill all lights. 
My grandfather, manning his light, is immediately ordered to put that candle out and pushes the searchlight straight down into the water, turning it off. When they finally stop moving, the crew can hear the low-tone humming of several planes passing parallel to their position. Everyone holds their breath and pretends to pretty much not exist, hoping the enemy doesn't make visual contact with the ships. So for a good long 45 minutes, everyone just sits there. Until they can no longer make audible contact with their enemy forces they hoped would pass. Finally, after almost two hours of nothing, they are given the go-ahead to start the engines and return to the passage. My grandfather flicks his cigarette port side and clicks on his searchlight, still pointing into the water. What he says he saw next aged him and the two others with him a good ten years. Below, where the searchlight sat focused in the water, lay an eyeball the size of a basketball, sitting there, staring straight back at him from about ten feet underwater. The next three seconds lasted minutes in his mind as he watched this silvery disc of an eye look straight through him. Finally, the first of the engines started in what seemed like forever, and the beast that it was broke surface for a brief moment in order to dive deep. Even before people acknowledged giant squid existed, before they were ever caught on camera, my grandfather believed because he had seen one within 20 feet of his face. In my eight years of service, I had heard many stories of such things and even own a few teeth pulled from the rubber liner of a ship, but never had any such experiences myself. Adding that experience in lieu of the drama of war, and you can get a sense for the true terror it would invoke. My grandfather, who passed away at 93 this July, told me this one growing up. Thanks to all that served and thanks for reading. This incident happened to me when I was a boy. My sister, myself, and my parents lived in a small trailer out in Connorsville, which is a little ways out from Bardo. My sister and I shared a room with a bunk bed, and there was always something kind of off about the room. There was one night when my mother came in while my sister and I had been asleep for probably three or four hours. She woke us both up and said, I don't know what it is, but you two need to come to sleep on the floor of your dad and mine's room. There's just something not right. So we hated to, but we went in there and we fixed the bed on the floor and my mom. She went through the house and checked the locks and everything, and everything was fine. So we all laid down and I'd say an hour and a half later. There were sounds at the front door and we heard the front door open. My mom was up, I guess, and my dad and sister both were asleep. I was still awake, and we heard pitter-patter, almost sounded like children running in the house. This was about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. The way the trailer was set up, you had a door that connected to the hallway and to my parents' bedroom and one into the bathroom. So we heard these things run into the bathroom. You could hear them giggling, and then it was just the weirdest sound. It didn't sound like a usual childish giggle. My mom thought she had locked both of the doors that connected to the bathroom and to the hallway. Well, the door that connected to the hallway, it opened slowly, and this little short thing peeked its head through. Pardon my French, but it scared the hell out of me. It looked almost like it was wearing a hood on part of its head. It was probably about two and a half to three feet tall, and the face it was a... The only way I can describe it was it looked almost like a gargoyle. As far as the face, deformed like some of them can actually get. It was grotesque, and it just giggled, putting its hand on its mouth almost like, you know, I didn't mean to disturb you. It just stood there for a minute, and I'm about to have a panic attack, you know, sitting there, staring at that thing. I couldn't move, I felt like I was in shock, and my mom, she didn't move or say anything, you know. I didn't think she knew I was awake. And after a few minutes, it went back in the bathroom with the other ones and shut the door. They were in there to close to daylight. Then the door opened, and then they went right back outside. I didn't tell my mom what I saw until a couple of days later. I was just too afraid that if I did, they would just come back. And I told her, and she told me she saw the same exact thing. Dave asks about what prompted her to go in and get the kids. That night, she had like a feeling like God was telling her to get the kids, bring them in the bedroom, they don't need to be in there. She said that's the only way she can describe it. 
She said she was laying there asleep, and then she just woke up, and that feeling just hit her harder than a brick. It felt like it was trying to make its territory known. Basically, we can come and go anytime we want. It was playing mind games with us, my mom and myself. The feeling I got from it was that it was not good. It was evil. In June of 1995, a man sightseeing in Quebec snapped 76 photos and made four videos of an area known as Parc des Seven Chutes, or Seven Chutes Park, near St. George's de Beauce, Quebec. As he browsed through the pictures, something odd caught his eye in photo number 32. There appeared to be something strange standing amid the trees. When the photo was enlarged, a tall brown figure with a baboon-like snout becomes clearer. Not only that, it seems to be clutching a white dog and appears to be staring towards the photographer. He had not seen it when he took the pictures. The photographer who wishes to remain anonymous went back to the area and had photos taken with a man standing in the same spot for comparison, as well as to see if there could be another explanation. Some skeptics have suggested it is a rock formation, but the subsequent area of photos do not support this theory. Others claim it's simply a case of pareidolia, the phenomena of seeing faces or other distinct images and objects such as clouds, tree formations, or even a cinnamon roll. Remember the famous cinnamon roll that had the uncanny likeness to Mother Teresa of Calcutta? There seems to be more than that to this particular image, however. So what is the thing, and why is it holding a small dog? If it's a Bigfoot, it doesn't match up with most descriptions by Bigfoot eyewitnesses. This animal has a snout like a dog or wolf, leading some to call it a dogman or a werewolf. I've always been fascinated by cryptids, creatures of folklore and mystery that exist on the fringes of our understanding. My friends and I often ventured into the backwoods of Montana, hoping to catch a glimpse of these elusive beings. But never in my wildest dreams did I expect to encounter something so eerie and inexplicable. The other night, our curiosity led us deeper into the forest than we had ever ventured before. As we trekked through the darkness, we heard strange yelps echoing through the trees, sending shivers down our spines. We knew we were not alone, and the hair on the back of our necks stood on end. And then, we saw it an intense yellow light glowing amidst the shadows. It danced and flickered, illuminating the surrounding foliage. It was like nothing we had ever seen before, and it seemed to move with an almost intelligent purpose. Fear and fascination battled within us as we stood there, transfixed by the mysterious light and the eerie sounds that accompanied it. We couldn't tear our eyes away, even though every instinct told us to run. It was as if the forest itself had come alive, and we were intruders in a realm we could not comprehend. Eventually, the intensity of the experience overwhelmed us, and we turned on our heels, fleeing from the strange phenomenon. We rushed back to the safety of civilization, our hearts pounding in our chests. We were shaken, unsure of what we had just witnessed. Back in the safety of our homes, we tried to rationalize what we had seen, was it some kind of natural phenomenon, a trick of the light, or perhaps an elaborate prank? But deep down, we knew it was something else, something beyond our understanding. Despite the fear, our curiosity remained unquenched. We couldn't let this encounter go without further investigation. So we made a bold decision we would return to the backwoods of Montana on Friday night, determined to unravel the mystery and perhaps catch another glimpse of the enigmatic yellow light. As Friday approached, we prepared ourselves mentally and emotionally for the upcoming adventure. We equipped ourselves with flashlights, cameras, and any gear that might help us document and understand this strange encounter. Our hearts raced as we entered the forest once again, this time under the veil of night. The memories of the previous night's encounter lingered, but our determination pushed us forward. We moved cautiously, following the same path we had taken before. The night was dark and quiet, with only the sounds of the wilderness surrounding us. As we ventured deeper, anticipation mingled with trepidation. And then, just as we hoped, the faint glow of the yellow light emerged from the depths of the forest. 
Holding our breaths, we approached slowly, determined to observe without disturbing whatever lay before us. The yelps echoed once more, and the yellow light danced, captivating us once again. But this time, we were prepared. We documented everything video footage, photographs, audio recordings. We were determined to gather as much evidence as possible to help us understand this cryptic presence. As the night wore on, we remained vigilant, hoping to witness more clues that might reveal the truth behind this elusive phenomenon. Time seemed to blur as we stayed hidden, waiting and observing, until the first light of dawn began to break through the trees. Exhausted and exhilarated, we emerged from the forest with a sense of accomplishment. We hadn't solved the mystery, but we had collected valuable data that might lead us closer to the truth. Now, as we analyze the evidence and share our experiences, our journey into the backwoods of Montana continues. The thrill of the unknown drives us forward, and we remain determined to uncover the secrets hidden within the darkness of the forest. Who knows what other cryptids and mysteries await us in the vast wilderness? The adventure has only just begun. Hello. I'm reporting that these entities were in my home on November 15, 2016 in Peoria, Illinois. I awoke around 2.30 a.m. to see three beings standing at my bedroom door. They are translucent, soft light emanating from their bodies. I sat up in my bed and stared intently. My impression was of a mother with a child. She was tall and lean with olive-colored dark eyes. She had long arms and no clothing. I could not see any specific genital shapes. Her mouth was narrow with an oval-shaped face, no hair on her body. The child entity stood next to her mother holding her leg. The child was up to her hips. I felt this was a boy. Same appearance, but smaller and stout with arms and legs. The eyes were very large and looking at me as if this was its first time seeing a human being. The third entity stood behind them same soft light emanating from the body. At this point, I could tell all three bodies were floating like a hologram. The third entity was different in that on top of its head were these antennas with olive-colored eyes. There must have been eight or so of these attached to the head and looked like part of the scalp. I thought this being was a scout and the antennas were cameras. I tried to get up out of bed and the beings turned their backs and floated down the hallway and disappeared. I thought, okay, that was a strange experience. Around 3 a.m. the next evening, the being with the antenna on the head appeared standing in my hall near my coat closet and hanging onto the woodwork. I looked up and waved my hand. It matched my hand wave and a slight smile like a Mona Lisa smile appeared on its face. I tried to get up and it disappeared. I could only describe the movement of the beings as watching seaweed floating in the ocean. They were opaque, but I could see through them. I remember feeling joy unlike any other, an overwhelming sense of love and wonderment. It was a marvelous experience. I wished to remain anonymous. My family would not believe me. I have told two close friends. Whether they believe or not, I do not care. I felt like sharing. I believe these beings walk among us at this moment, observing us. Maybe they are here to help or just waiting to pick up the pieces after we are departed. When I was about 14 or 15 years old, my parents went out for a date night, and I was watching my little sister who was about 12. She wanted to go next door to watch a movie with her friend. Her friend's mom worked nights, so she was there alone. I told her fine. Around midnight or so, she calls the house crying, telling me to come over and help and hung up. I had no idea what was going on, so I ran over there and busted through the front door, screaming their names. They didn't answer, and I found them sitting on the ground in the corner of the kitchen, literally freaking out. They told me that the pantry door slammed by itself while they were in the living room. The living room and kitchen are connected, but separated by a counter, so they watched it happen. I thought they were full of shit and just were watching a scary movie and convinced themselves they saw it. Almost immediately after that a door upstairs shuts. I heard it and told them it was probably just a window that was left open that caused it to happen. 
I was so convinced that was it. I had them follow me upstairs to check. I wish. I had never done that because we checked every room and no windows were open. Kind of confused, we headed back downstairs. I make it maybe four steps down where the door at the top of the stairs opens and slams shut like someone kicked it shut. Hi everyone. I don't normally make posts like this, but this is a very strange occurrence that I just had the urge to share. I do consider myself spiritual, but I am in no way religious or actively practicing anything. Yesterday, I was in my bedroom with my younger sister, and I was braiding her hair. It was taking a long time and I really had to use the bathroom, so I told her to give me a minute and I walked out. It's important to keep in mind, I didn't tell her where I was going, what I was doing, or how long I would be gone. I just got up and went straight to the bathroom. I was in there for about 10 minutes because I had gotten into an argument with my friend over text, which is important to note because it doesn't normally take me long to use the bathroom. After I'm finished, I walk out of the bathroom to wash my hands our sink is on the outside. When I walked out, I was in direct view of my sister because the sink is across from my bedroom door. As I was washing my hands, I noticed she was staring at me with a perplexed look on her face, so I asked her what was wrong. She calmly asks me how I could have walked out the bathroom. This was a very oddly worded question, so I asked her what she meant. She asked me, weren't you just in the living room? And I told her, no, I've been in the bathroom the whole time. My sister began to look very sick as she told me, I just talked to you in the living room, when did you walk in the bathroom? In a very concerned tone, I insisted to her that I did not enter the living room, and since I had gotten up and walked out of my bedroom, there was no point in which I had entered the living room. I asked her what I had said to her when she saw me in the living room. She tells me that she saw me sitting on the couch with my hands neatly folded, and I was staring off into space. She then told me that I had a very disturbed and concerned look on my face, which prompted her to ask me what was wrong, to which she claims I responded, nothing, in an eerie tone. My sister claims that she the me she had seen looked just like me. My hair was in a loose bun. I was wearing my same gray shirt and old red pajama pants. My face was the same. Everything was the same. But it wasn't me. I know it wasn't me because I have no recollection of that happening. I was in the bathroom the entire time distracted by my heated discussion. I have no idea how this happened, but my sister told me after our exchange. She felt nauseous, like something was off. I'm not sure what to make of this. I am a pretty rational person and have heard stories like this before. I want to look into possible carbon monoxide poisoning because it has been known to cause hallucinations. However, only my sister has experienced this. Neither me nor my roommate have seen anything out of the ordinary. We've been theorizing about parallel universes, possession, demons, curses, but we really don't know what's going on and are just looking for some answers. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.